Do you have enough life insurance? Think about it. Your loved ones could face disaster unless you provide for them now. Well, here's some good news. Just call Best Quote and chances are you could double your current coverage without paying a penny more. Regardless of your age or history, Best Quote has always been the best way to find the best rates from leading insurance companies. Imagine saving up to 70% on your premiums. For instance, a 35-year-old non-smoking male can get a quarter million dollars of coverage for less than $12 a month, guaranteed for 10 years. There's no obligation. Just call Best Quote for free information in the mail. Compare the rates. If you decide to buy, you call them. No salesman ever contacts you. With Best Quote, you can get more insurance and pay less. Rates are coming down, so now is the best time ever to call Best Quote. Call toll free 1 800 443 2005. That's 1 800 443 2005. Call 1 800 443 2005. Dependent on underwriting, Nicola GRX 10 Premier. Available in most states. Steve Rubin Licensed Agent. Call for state specific licensing. Did you know that media mogul Ted Turner's net worth is estimated at $5 billion? Listen to his success story and how Wall Street played an important role. In 1971, with little or no money, Ted Turner merged his small billboard company into a publicly traded company called Rice Broadcasting. Creatively capitalizing on the situation, Ted Turner was able to access capital and build a media empire that began with the very first superstation, WTBS. This was only the beginning. Turner went on to create the the Cartoon Network, and Turner Film Classic. After an unsuccessful attempt to take over CBS television, Turner Broadcasting was acquired by AOL Time Warner, one of the largest media conglomerates in the world. Fortunes were made for those early shareholders of Rice Broadcasting that chose to participate. Like most things in life, those who get in at the earliest level stand to profit the most if the right opportunity presents itself. Check out International Broadcasting Corporation, a publicly traded company, ticker symbol IBC. International Broadcasting has three divisions, each focused on a niche market in the areas of broadcasting and Internet content. One of the most exciting ventures of the company is the creation of the IBC Radio Network, a 24-7 all-talk radio channel. The network is rapidly growing and gaining worldwide recognition for its unique shows, like Stock Talk Live, believed to be the very first business radio talk show focused exclusively on live, continuous coverage of microcap stocks throughout the entire stock market day. Other shows include The Lou Gentilly Show, a paranormal radio talk show covering a wide range of paranormal subjects like UFOs and alien abductions, government cover-ups, and haunting. Talk Show America is the home of entertaining, informative, and riveting political conservative talk radio. Are you a night owl? Don't miss Late Night Extreme Talk, a live call-in talk show from Las Vegas, Nevada, exploring some of the hottest issues of our day, news, politics, entertainment, and much more. So if you're looking for a unique investment opportunity, check out International Broadcasting Corporation, ticker symbol IBCS. Remember, investing is risky. As with all investments, you should consult with a financial advisor before getting involved. This announcement is paid for by IBCS and is not a solicitation to buy or sell securities. Always read the prospectus before making any investment decision. You could lose some or all of your money. You could make money, too. For more information, visit the website at www.ibcmedia.com. That's www.ibcmedia.com. Attention inventors, need a patent? Then you need Inventech, the launch pad for new ideas. Inventech understands the needs of inventors like you. And only Inventech offers a free new product market analysis. It's the first step towards a patent and marketing success. Call 1-800-598-8181. That's 1-800-598-8181. With your market analysis, receive a free video and learn the secrets the pros use to take it to the next level. Be first to the marketplace while your idea is still high. With our worldwide experience, InventTech can turn your idea into reality. Learn if your idea has the right stuff for marketing success. It's free. Don't let this opportunity slip away. Call now and receive your free analysis, free marketing info, and a free video. Take that all-important first step towards turning your dream into reality. Call 1-800-598-8181 to receive your free package loaded with info. That's 1-800-598-8181. Call now. Technologies. 
Want a free cell phone with an outstanding rate plan? North Star Technologies has hundreds of cell phones and numerous rate plans to choose from, all at heavily discounted prices. An example of just one of these great deals includes a free Nokia 3390 cell phone, free car charger, free belt clip, and a hands-free system at no charge with a rate plan of 1,000 minutes of calling, free rollover unused minutes, and free voicemail, all for $39.99 per month. Visit North Star Technologies on the web at www.northstar-technologies.com or call toll-free at 1-888-408-7344. That's 1-888-408-7344. North Star Technologies, your company for the lowest prices on telephone and Internet services. Tell them Lou Gentili sent ya. Live from Philadelphia, welcome to the Lou Gentili Show. Phone lines open at 11 p.m. Eastern. Call the Lou Gentilly Show toll-free at 1-800-594-9270. And now, here's the king of paranormal controversy, your host, Lou Gentilly. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Lou Gentilly Show. This is Lou Gentilly here with you till 1 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time. One more day till Friday. Tonight is Thursday. All night long. <laughs> anyway, it's interesting information. Actually, it's <laughs> my head is so far up my rear, it's unbelievable. Thursday, April the 24th, 2003. Some interesting news about uh, Horror Find Weekend. Alice Cooper will be appearing. So Alice Cooper will be on the show at some point uh, within the next couple of months, uh, as well as uh, a lot of the people that are going to be appearing at Horror Find Weekend 2003 in Maryland. For further information, you can go to their website, horrorfindweekend.com. And uh, Alice Cooper will be there, and uh, Tracy Lords will be there, and uh, people from uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and some of our friends of the show um, will also be there. You can check it all out at uh, horrifyingweekend.com. And uh, very interesting stuff. Now, at the same time, uh, the big event that uh, was, it was announced, I believe, last night was uh, about Penn State. Penn State's Paranormal Conference 2003, and uh, that link will be, that link should be up uh, very shortly. They are accepting tickets now, and uh, tickets are 30 bucks, and hotel rooms are 44 dollars. Can't beat that. That's in State College, Pennsylvania. So you might want to check it out. We'll, we'll get you a link uh, by the end of the show, as well as it'll be up on the website. For further information, so we get more than enough time, and we're going to uh, start pushing a lot of this stuff. So, anyway, check out our website, lugentilly.com. That's L-O-U-G-E-N-T-I-L-E.com for the latest in paranormal news, as well as over 2,800 paranormal photographs, videos, and audio files. Nine independent Internet streams, if you listen to us on the net. Two live video feeds. Archives of show, live shows, everything, it's all for free, LouGentilly.com, message board, chat room, sign the guest book, get on the mailing list, need I say any more. Anyway, tonight, we're going to be speaking with Michael Horn, the UFO researcher, author, and producer. We're going to be speaking about UFOs, ET Contact, Billy Meyer, and uh, among other things. And I suggest we go to his website at www.andyettheyfly.com. That's the name of his book. It's also the name of his website. Again, that's andyettheyfly.com. 
com. And we are going to be speaking about his book, And Yet They Fly, during the show. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I would like to welcome tonight's guest, Michael Horn. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Lou. Thank you. Can I quickly jump in with just one correction so that I don't take credit for something I didn't do? Uh-oh, go ahead. <laughs> the book is actually written by an Austrian man named Guido mm-hmm. Moosbrugger, and uh, he he uh, does not speak English, so the book, in its English translation, uh, is represented in America by me. Okay. I only wish I could have written such a book. <laughs> but thank you. Well, that's cool. I- I'm not going to try pronouncing that name. Yeah. Just to let you know that. <laughs> so yeah, no problem. It's your book for the next two, ou- two <laughs> hours or whatever. We'll so. just say Guido's book. Then. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Now, now explain to me how you got involved with, with UFOs. What fascinated you growing up as a child? Well, you know, that uh, that's actually where it started. I was very young. I used to have... Uh, dreams of lights moving through the sky, of disc-shaped things. I had a sense of standing, when I was very young, standing underneath an object, a disc-shaped object, and I had an understanding that it rotated and that it could move uh, not only up and down but in 360 other directions, and it had to do somehow with the rotation of this part of it, and I had a dream of being spoken to by somebody who had a kind of dome-shaped, baldish head, similar to what the one I've now acquired myself. And I was not able to remember what I was told. Uh, I had questions about, you know, the nature of life in the universe and, you know, what's outside of space and all that stuff. So I also, growing up in the 50s, was fond of the space TV shows that were happening at the time, which only, I'm sure, the boomers will remember, like Captain Video and stuff like that. And, uh, after that, I never got involved in science fiction. It never really interested me. I was probably one of the last people to see Star Wars and all that business. In 1979, in a uh, bookstore in the West Hollywood area of Los Angeles, I saw this coffee table size photo book with the most stunning, remarkable photographs of UFOs that uh, one could imagine. And these were not lights in the sky at night. These were clear daytime photos. And some of the photos had three uh, or four of the ships in them. And there were also uh, some quotations in the uh, panels of the photographs attributed to the people who ostensibly were the extraterrestrials. There was information in the book on the contactee, Billy Meyer, and his family and the people around him who had taken lie detector tests and the some of the photographic analysis that had been done with computers. And they discussed the evidence in there. And it was a stunning, stunning book. There wasn't much more I could do with it at the time except just read it and look at the pictures, you know, in awe. It wasn't until 1986 when I was visiting Sedona, Arizona, hotbed of unusual activity, that uh, while I was in a little cafe with my daughter waiting for a uh, alfalfa sprout sandwich or something like that, I met another fellow seated in the back of the cafe who uh, we got to talking. We were only about four or five of us in the whole place. And health food uh, stores and restaurants are notoriously slow in, in their cautious and careful preparation of your uh, sandwich and whole grain bread. So we were there for a while, got to talking about phenomenon. Uh, one thing led to another, UFOs, and we started to talk about the Billy Meyer case. And then this fellow said to me, have you read the contact notes? And I said, well, what's that? He said, well, you have the photo book. You ever wonder about those quotations? And I said, yes, I have. And he said, well, there's almost 2,000 pages of conversations between Billy and these people. And those those quotes that are in there, those few that are scattered throughout the book, as impress, impressive as they are uh, and thought-provoking, they are but a small, small sampling of what you could find in these contact notes. And I said, well, where do I get them? He said, well, when you come back to L.A., I live out in Malibu. Why don't you come on down and, uh, you know, get them? And I'll give them to you and to read. And, indeed, uh, I did. And I spent days and hours and and weeks on end, because the translations also were a little difficult to understand. They had been translated by somebody who wasn't all that fluent in English, uh, you know, grammar and syntax, but it was all there. And not only that, there was tremendous uh, numbers of different things that were popping out at me, even when I read this, because they were kind of scientific in nature. They were talking to this man about ozone damage and atomic bomb testing and genetic mutations and uh, plankton and, you know, the food chain disruption. And this was like 1975. And I said, gee, what's that about? So what got me really fired, uh, apart from being able to read these fascinating and compelling uh, transcripts was, and I received those in about 1986, I should add, 
a um, couple years later, I was reading a local newspaper, and there was an article that jumped out at me, and it was a report, I think it was from AP or some, something like that, that Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories had just announced a connection between A-bomb testing and the ozone damage. So I said, where did I see that before? And I reached under the bed for these uh, dusty you know, transcripts, and there in the seventh contact or so, I looked and I said, wait a minute, but they told him that, you know, 1975. This is 13 years later. How could he have known? Right. From that point, and I'll, I'll just tell you this, I don't just ramble on here, but you, you kind of got the ball rolling. You pulled the thread on my connection to this. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, so what happened was over the years I have found uh, either, you know, serendipitously, accidentally noticing published articles or hearing something on the news, and I'd go back and I'd pull up the contact notes, and there would be this stuff five years, 10, 15, 20 years prior. Meyer had published it. And that's when I started to think, you know, there's a lot more to this than UFOs. Hmm. Well, what, do you th- what do you think there, there is? Well, I'll start in a sense at the top, what I think it's about at this point. Okay. And then, you know, we can work it any way you want to. I know we've got a little time, but I'm going to jump to it. What I think has happened here is, number one, in evaluating all the material that I could get a hold of, and that includes looking at all of the physical evidence, the stunning photographs, the films, there's a video taken in 1981. There are sound recordings that people can actually download from the website, try and duplicate if they want to, either the way Meyer recorded them on a cassette machine outside, or they can try it with synthesizers, whatever. And there were also metal samples that were analyzed by Marcel Vogel, the late uh, scientist who worked with IBM. All of the physical evidence actually remains irreproducible. And I'll talk a little more about the challenge that I made to three famous psychics. And that's probably not psychic skeptics. Skeptics, yeah. They hate hearing that. Big right. difference. <laughs> Big difference, right. They, they might as well call themselves psychics. They were about as accurate. Um, but I looked at all that physical evidence, and then I looked at all of this other, what I would call prophetically accurate, scientific, and world event-related information, where Meyer published information primarily given to him by, allegedly by these people, and it pre- predated everything. So my conclusion... After I looked at that, I I said, what I think is happening here is that these folks and Meyer have established a base of impeccable credibility. For those that want to do the research for themselves, they can test that hypothesis and those conclusions out for themselves. If they can come to another conclusion based on facts and evidence, that would be very interesting to see. I haven't, in 25 years of looking at this, I can't find another legitimate conclusion. Now, let's take it to to really answer your question, what is this about? In establishing, at least from my point of view, impeccable credibility over a 30-year period where you can take their information to the bank, what is the payoff here? What are we supposed to look at? What we have in front of us, and shortly everybody will have in front of them, it's not yet been officially uh, published in English, there are prophecies, if you will, that... um, originated in in terms of publication by Meyer in 1981. They were updated by these people who call themselves Pleiarans. Uh, people know this as Pleiadians. It doesn't matter right now what we call them. These were updated in 1987 for Meyer. And Meyer himself in 1995 also made, uh, well, he, he compiled a document called the 251st Contact of prophetic information that is probably co- covers several centuries at least in terms of events and occurrences and developments in humankind. Now, the the problem, if you will, or the challenge here, and perhaps the raison d'etre at least right now, is a lot of this prophetic material from 81 and 87, we're going back a ways, okay. foretells the times we are in right now in fair detail. The danger of these times and the events that are unfolding right now, they have cautioned as long ago as 81 and 87 that if certain events occur and if humanity does not switch its course, we will end up in a very, very bad situation. The a euphemism for um, enormous destruction worldwide and even specifically in America. Let me just say this, since I don't want to come off as some idiot prophet of doom. I'm reporting on information. 
and it will be up to any and everybody interested to do as much research themselves. This document itself will be available shortly. I will be able to even share it. I can read the unapproved but almost approved version of it and in part or in whole tonight. We can go in and out of these things if you want. What I want to emphasize is that a prophecy, according to them, differs from a prediction. Mm -hmm. Predictions are things, so they say, that are going to happen and are unalterable. In most cases, they won't give advance warning of certain predictions because people naturally, knowing that something is foretold, and let's say for the near future, would do everything they could to alter that event. If it's a prediction, so we're told, attempting to simply alter that outcome, which is the result of cause and effect, will create even worse outcome. Prophecies, on the other hand, are the logical occurrence of causative actions that still could be altered if enough of the mass consciousness awakens and chooses to course correct. They are very specific about what they say these course corrections should be, who needs to be course corrected if we want to survive and not find ourselves in tremendous destruction. Uh, that's kind of where, what I think it's about for right now. This ha comes with an enormous amount of positive uh, information, suggestions, uh, you might want to call it advice that we can take or not take on any number of different levels and approaches to straightening ourselves out. It's a long process, but if we don't have enough people awakening to it, it would appear you know, right now, we will get a, a very unpreferred result. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I guess how we can start off with this is, uh, let's, I mean, we have, uh, I don't know if you know how the show works, we basically have commercials in the beginning and at the very end of the show, so we got like 50 minutes of talk time, so. Okay. Let's, uh, let's start off um, with some of these letters. Is that what it is? Oh, uh, you mean the, the prophecy type of stuff? Yeah. Is All right, you, well, is, that you, is that where you want to start off at? I can, yeah. Now, I'm, I'm at a, a partial disadvantage, not really all that much. My only disadvantage is that my Internet connection went down. But I do have some things that are in front of me that I can definitely refer to here, and I will. Okay. Um, bear with me. Let me mention a couple of things, uh, by the way, and that is okay. that, well, let me do this. I'm going to tell people that on the website, And Yet They Fly, there is a link that says irrefutable scientific evidence or proof or something like that at the top. As I say, I can't get on it right now. Okay. Clicking on that will bring you to a page where there will be some documents, and you'll be able to see the you know, irrefutable scientific proof claim. And in that document, and I'll be referring to it because, I mean, I know some of the stuff that's in there, but in that document I have listed in pretty much in chronological order the things that Meyer was told in a specific context. He numbered all the contacts, and the dates are there. And then I did, uh, in, in some cases, you know, I found things in newspapers and all that, but then I went on the Internet and searched on every one I could to see, A, if that information was validated. Did the event occur? Did the, did the scientific discovery occur? Or if it did, when did it happen? What was the earliest date of occurrence or discovery? As you and your listeners can see from going on there, and I only wish I could join you, okay. um, you will find that, of the corroboration, wherever the corroboration is, Meyer did precede and predate the earliest information that I could find. Now, maybe it's very possible that I didn't get everything, you know, and that people can find something that where uh, Meyer wasn't the first. And, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not saying that isn't so. I just did the best I could in research to try to find out when and where, and I was pretty impressed with his particular level of accuracy. Now, in that document, just so we can, you know, go over a little bit, I did mention that there are, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a whole bunch of things that are environmental in relationship that were related to environmental damage, and those are some of the earliest ones. Then there were astronomical discoveries where Meyer um, uh, published information pertaining to, let's see, Jupiter and Venus specifically. Now, I, w I want to talk to you a little bit about the one on Venus. Uh, people can read there. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting because the main investigator on this case, the lead investigator on this case, is Wendell Stevens, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Air uh, U.S. Air Force, retired. And Wendell uh, headed the team. 
that did all the research, and there were, of course, a number of other players, Lee and Britt Elders and Tom Welch and Jim Dilatoso and perhaps some other people whose names I'm leaving out. Wendell Stevens had in his possession in 1979 a huge amount of information on prophetic things that had not occurred. Mm -hmm. And it came about as an accident. He was doing investigation, uh, you know, with them on the case, and he'd asked Billy for something. Apparently, Billy told somebody to give Wendell this document, not knowing that Billy only wanted him to have a certain portion of it. The the reason for it was, as I mentioned before, with predictions, they're not supposed to be known or publicized to the masses before they happen because of the you know, aforementioned uh, interference that humans would do. Well, Wendell, when he got back to the U.S., he realized that he had been given a whole bunch of predictive information that had not occurred yet. And he got in touch with two other people that he trusted quite a bit. Another uh, former military man, I think his name was uh, Major uh, Pestalozzi, and then uh, Mr. Norton, who was with the Flandrau Planetarium in Tucson. They looked at the information, they signed off on it, and they put it away until after all the events occurred. Those events are also, uh, that document is included in our scientific proof now because there were things like the Soviet uh, invasion of Afghanistan, the Chinese invasion of North Vietnam, the Jonestown Massacre, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and in there was specific information about Jupiter. Now, what Meyer uh, ostensibly uh, was discussing in 1978, October of 1978, with this woman whose name is pronounced Semyaze, who was a contact person for him, uh, they were uh, ostensibly, again, I'll just say allegedly ostensibly once, so the rest of it, you know, you can figure out whether you think it's true or not. They're in her craft, and they're up close and personal with the planet Jupiter. And Meyer is commenting about the rings of Jupiter and, you know, how we don't yet know that Jupiter has rings, and she said, well... Uh, Earth scientists will discover that in a few months when the American probe goes by, and they will then discover, you know, that uh, the rings are there, and then they start to discuss the composition of the rings. And Meyer says, as, as I recall, you told me at a previous time, he's, he's speaking to her, that um, the rings are composed of fine dust particles and sulfur ions that come off of the moon Io, which is the most volcanically active body in the entire solar system that the, these volcanoes are spewing forth at tremendous velocities, up to 2,300 kilometers per hour, all of this material, it goes up to a height of about 180 kilometers, and quite a bit of it is taken up into the rings. The rest of it falls back onto the surface of Io, and uh, there's not a lot of craters there because the rest of this material is kind of covering it over, and it's a smooth, glassy surface, and he's describing you know, the, the moon, then he goes on to describe some more things about Jupiter that were not yet known at that time. Five months later, in March of uh, 1979, the U.S. probe went by, and they discovered that Jupiter had rings. Well, you know, people could say, well, you know, five months, he cheated, what have you, uh, somebody's lying. But in 1998, I think it was September, Cornell University astronomers come out with a new finding. They say that they now believe that the rings of Jupiter are composed of dust particles coming off of the moons of Jupiter. And I scratched my head and said, where did I read that before? It went over, pulled it out, and there it was. <laughs> now, this is in copyrighted published books from 1979 that Wendell right. Stevens put out, and it's in the contact notes that I read in 1986. So no matter how you cut it, Meyer beats them. Well, I wanted to see if, what I could do with this, so I actually called up uh, you know, through finding through the Internet, a professor of astronomy, chairman of the Department of Astronomy at Cornell University. His name is Joseph Viverka. And to his credit and character, as far as I'm concerned, when I started telling him about a UFO case, he simply said, well, send me some information. Most scientists, you know, brush you off. Uh, we, I, I sent him this thing about, you know, Jupiter's moons and the, the dust formation. Now, understand that the scientists, the astronomers, believe that although the moons are the source of the dust, that the way the dust is really coming about is that meteorites are striking these moons and throwing up dust clouds, and that the dust from these clouds is what's actually uh, being, you know, going up into the atmosphere and forming the, um, the rings. Now, my own layman's reasoning is telling me that while a meteorite may indeed kick up, you know, quite a cloud of dust, 
by virtue of a cloud shape and a lack of sustained power behind a cloud, that's simply the, the result of a solitary hit. Only a relatively small portion of dust is going to find its way high up enough to be taken into the rings. The rest of it's got to be dispersed because it's not propelled. So ultimately, it's going to settle back down on the surface of the moon. So my, my point would be that even with the most modest consideration, volcanic expulsion and you know propulsion is going to be at least as likely to be a cause because a cause because you have a far more contained, directed, and concentrated mass with sustained and direct, directed power underneath it. You've got velocity of a much longer duration and force than could be expected of a more amorphously cloud, you know, shaped cloud that lacks any controlled and sustained accelerating force beyond, uh, you know, and beneath it beyond the impact. So I have not yet heard back from uh, pr the professor on this, but. What he did say when we were discussing this, and I was talking to him about, you know, this thing that Meyer had already published about Io being the most volcanically active body in the solar system, which we certainly didn't know because we hadn't seen it. And so he said, and this is the quote from him regarding Meyer saying that, he said, if he said that about Io three to six months before, then all I can say is that he's right. Now, for a scientist to say that is pretty big. But And he also said, in all fairness, he says, about the rings, I'm not so sure. We believe the rings are formed differently, but we can't be sure because we aren't close, up close enough to take a look. That's fair enough. So we have this particular stunning bit of information. And for anybody who thinks, well, it's a lucky guess, ask yourself, in 1978, were you contemplating if Jupiter had rings? Mm -hmm. Were you you know, musing over if they did, if it did have rings, how they were formed, and could there be a volcanically active moon circling the planet, spewing the stuff up? This is one of the things about the Meyer case. There is so much information covering so many different areas in science. Uh, you've got, in terms of world events, you've got earthquakes, floods, wars, assassinations, invasions, natural disasters, marriages, divorces, the famous, they covered everything. And when you're looking back in time between 1975 and 1980, let's say when the bulk of this information was you know, given to Meyer and published by him, and this is a one-armed man living on, a, at that time, a fairly ramshackle farm, 40, 50 miles outside of Zurich, Switzerland, raising a family with three kids, and uh, while he's publishing this stuff, he's also taking photographs that ultimately um, numbered up to nearly 1,500. He's made eight 8-millimeter eight film segments. He had a 40-minute recording of the sounds of the UFO, the ones that are on the website. We've got a three-minute clip of it. This was done in an open field with he and his wife with cassette machines and 15 witnesses from around the countryside who came when they heard these very unusual whirring sounds going on. And then there's metal samples. Now, the, on top of that, you start having all this information that you can take to the bank that's accurate about such a diverse array of, 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 of things, some of which have only been validated in the past several years and some even more recently. This, to me, says, well, either we're going to have to say, as the skeptics probably want us to believe, that Meyer is an above-genius level master photographer, filmmaker, special effects expert, sound engineer, metallurgist, and gosh forbid, as far as the psychics are concerned, as far as the skeptics are concerned, a psychic of, you know, phenomenal accuracy. So either that or the guy's telling the truth. Now, since he survived his 19th documented assassination attempt in August, and one would be enough to get me going into a new career, I would say that it's a lot of trouble that somebody or somebodies are taking for a guy that's miraculously hoaxing all this stuff. Coming back to the main point, all of the prayers and hopes and dreams that we have that we'll get help from on high, whatever that may mean to anybody, I think we've been given that help. I think it's been inserted into our world in a kind of oblique manner, in a kind of almost crossword puzzle fashion or a picture puzzle fashion, maybe more accurately, and we've been prompted a little bit to put the pieces together so that if we choose to, we can work with that information to the, our own betterment and ultimately survival. Hmm. Wow. 
Where do we go from here? Well, there's a lot. To, I mean, I'll, I'm happy to to try to tell you what this is. You know, what I'm finding here, and, and the, the important thing is that anybody listening to us tonight can do it a good percentage of this research themselves. Because what they could do, if they look at the document that I've gathered and put on a website, they can take those uh, specific occurrences. You know, when you might want to call prophetically accurate that I'm claiming are so, mm-hmm. and then do their own searches whatever search engines, and see, did these things happen? When was the earliest time, et cetera, et cetera? Now they might say, well, how do we know that Meyer really said it then? Well, those books are out there. Um, many people own the, the set of books that Wendell Stevens published. They're, they are collector's items now. Many people still have these original weird Swiss German to English translations uh, that were disseminated in the late 70s or early 80s, as I have still parts of them left sitting around here. So that is... That stuff is, this is where the human mind in our world today is, if it chooses to deal with this, is going to have to come to terms with something. We're not talking about lights in the sky. We're not talking about anecdotal information, rumors, channeling, space brothers with their benevolent, uh, you know, kind of generalized happy talk. What we're talking about is information that was published 20, 23, 4, 5 years ago, whatever, in books that much of which has not occurred until in the past several years, some 10 years ago, whatever. How do you fake it? I went in February of 2001 to an organization based in L.A. here called CFI West, that's Center for Inquiry West. That is the skeptics organization associated with the amazing Randy, the famous magician and debunker. Right. Now, let me just say, I think skeptics actually play an important part in research, the only problem is when it becomes a religion where the premise is that we know what reality is, and if a thing doesn't fit in, therefore it's a hoax, right. th- that becomes cultic and religious. Well, that's how most of them are, though. I'm sorry? That's how most of them are, though. Yes. Well, here's what happened. I walked in there. I had called up and made an appointment to see an, uh, a project manager investigator there named uh, Mr. Vaughn Rees, and I brought in the f- picture book and some photos. I brought in the video that had Myers film clips, and I showed it all to him, and Mr. Reese said to me, and I quote, this is an easily duplicated hoax. I said, oh, okay, that might be. Maybe you can spare me some embarrassment because I go out and I talk about this case, and to me, it seems pretty good. Now, this was before I'd locked in all the research that I've done in the past two years since then on the Internet, checking out all these you know, bits of info. Mm-hmm. I said, you mean you're going to... You're going to show me you can duplicate this. He says, yeah, I can do it. I said, fine, okay. Duplicate one photo and one of these film segments. He had pointed to a film segment where Meyer zooms in in broad daylight on a craft. I mean, you can see the flanging and, the, you know, the, the, the beveled edges. And, the, and not only that, you can see two appear to be lights that go off at different times in broad daylight off of the two different parts of the ship. He says, well, that's easy to hoax. You see, all he did is he had this model, and then he took the film, and he scratched it with a pin. I said, okay, you're on. He says, yeah, I can do that. So over the next few months, I was in touch with him, and there was always some reason they were delayed, and then they were going to move, and blah, 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 blah. I said, look, I think this thing with the cameras, even though you, you claim you have them, might be holding you up a little bit. Why don't you do this? Use computers, use digital effects, Photoshop, anything you can get your hands on. But if you really want to be a sport about it, Mr. Reese, use one hand because Meyer is a one-armed man. And even though we have photos and films here with three and four of these in one frame, that's a lot of hubcap tossing and trickery to, you know, to pretty good. Go ahead, use a computer. Well, I don't uh, get anything from him, in, uh, and that was of May of 2001. I run into Mr. Reese a couple months ago here in L.A. at the... Conscious Living Expo, and we discuss things. And he says, well, I haven't had a chance uh, to do it really. Uh, we, Our photo lab is just getting up. And I said, well, you know, photo lab is very nice. I said, you know, Mr. Meyer dropped his film off at the local uh, photo lab here, in, you know, in his little town. Uh, and you need a photo lab now to do this? So I got into a further email debate with them, and then I got into an email thing with the amazing Randy. I had already gotten into an email exchange with Michael Shermer, a science writer and also connected with Skeptic Magazine. We will post that email exchange, but if people go to the Jeff Rents, R-E-N-S-E dot com website, there is an article of mine there called uh, Amazing Randy versus Billy Meyer or something like that. And I tell the story 
of, of this and what they said and how, how unfortunately weak their response was to, to being challenged on this. I mean, it, it was hysterical. They all were talking about, with the exception of Mr. Reese, they were talking about how easily any child could make these photos. And I pointed out that that didn't bode well for Mr. Reese and CFI West since he had been unable to do what apparently a bunch of anonymous, precocious children uh, have done. Not that they've sent any photographs in, but they were claiming kids could do this. So when the hard evidence on that level uh, still hasn't been duplicated by these you know, various geniuses and skeptics, uh, I no longer worry much about their point of view, and I think we have to move on from paying attention to people that want to claim that you know this is a hoax because they can't they can't debunk it, they can't duplicate it, and they certainly can't do what Meyer did. I said to Mr. Reese when I saw him, I said, "Look, why don't you, you know, if you want to still mess around with the photos, maybe in a couple of years you'll send me something, but why don't you do something that Meyer did? Why don't you give me some accurate scientific information that won't be known for 20 years?" And you know we'll we'll, uh, we'll touch base then if I'm still wobbling around the planet. So the skeptics are are not uh, at this point showing any credibility. And I think uh, you know if people want to contact them and encourage them to make their you know, prove their case, that would be great because the amazing Randy has a million dollar offer out there for anybody who can prove a paranormal claim. All he has to do is go to the website, download the sound sample, and try and duplicate it with anything he can get his hands on. And he probably should send Mr. Meyer a million bucks at that point. But of course, if you if you publish prophetically accurate information in a wide array of different areas, you know, decades in advance, I think that qualifies too. How do you do that? You know, so that part of it, people can play with. They can do their own research. And then, as you look at this more serious stuff, for instance, I'll, I'll quote something uh, from the book. Guido's book has a portion of the. Uh, 1995 document that Meyer wrote. And I first saw this writing in 1998 when I downloaded it from the Internet. And it was uh, then published in Guido's book, which came out in September 16th, I think, of 2001. I can uh, verbatim remember the first sentence is, on a broader scale, expect a strike involving the USA and its president that will stun the entire world. He goes on to say, additionally, uh, lengthy deliberations about Islamic fundamentalism, wars, uprising, and terrorism will, you know, mesmerize the entire globe with Islamic fundamentalism playing a very sad part in the scenario. He goes on to talk about the spread of AIDS, mad cow disease, the fact that it's going to go into other species, and a new disease that will arise. Well, when I was in Switzerland, and I had a chance, uh, this was last May, to ask the people there about this strike, in, you know, that will involve the USA and its president, I said, well, are you talking about the Twin Towers? And they said, no, no. When you translate the 1987 prophecy, you'll see more about that. I said, oh, really? They said, no, that is talking about the attacks that America is going to launch of Afghanistan and Iraq. And I said, you've got to be kidding. They said, no, you'll see there will be a stunning strike involving the USA and its president. Well, I don't think the words could be any closer. We just had shock and awe. How about stunning, you know, a strike that will stun the entire world? And then Islamic fundamentalism. Now, I don't know if SARS is the disease he was talking about, but we know that in the last year, mad cow disease has indeed jumped species to other species. So, And that's only part of it. I mean, Meyer had written long ago about genetic experiments that were going to involve human and pig DNA. Those started to occur not too long ago. Not only were those experiments... Uh, written about, he said, ultimately, they will be doing hybridization, human and uh, pig DNA, that will lead to a human pig uh, warriors, if you will. In other words, a hybrid being. I may be able to get on the Internet. It looks like my service just jumped back, and we can look at some more of these things specifically together if you want. But he's got so many things in that Contact 251, including a warning of what the um, uh, the warning signs for World War III would be. And there's some very specific things in there. Well, well most of his information, I, I mean, he's contacting them psychically or, or hand or first well, person? Yeah, this is basically. good. Because you'll bring me to explain this a little better. When he was five years old, Meyer, Billy Meyer, Billy Edward Albert Meyer had his first contacts with the extraterrestrials. He and his father had seen a silver 
object fly overhead in Switzerland in the little area that they lived, the little rural area. Was it yes, a big, big object? Or? Was, and his father said, well, it's probably a weapon being tested by Adolf Hitler. And they let it go at that. Uh, shortly thereafter, Billy had a calling, if you will, like a sense to go into the woods uh, near his home where he spent time anyhow. And he followed the instinct. He went into the woods area and he saw a pear-shaped craft sitting on the ground with a, a man who appeared to be quite elderly at the time in a, in a kind of, he said it looked almost like a diver suit or, you know, what we would call now a space suit. And that this man beckoned him and he said he felt no fear. He didn't, uh, it wasn't, now this is 1942, you know, before uh, these kind of days where, you know, people beckoning children is, is cause for great concern. Uh, of course, this was pretty strange, but he felt no fear about it and he went forward and he said this man, um, had him come on board this ship with him, this, this vehicle, and uh, these contacts, these were contacts that took place then over a period of a few years, and the man told him things. He put apparatus on uh, Billy's head, which he was told was putting information into him, things that he would become consciously aware of later, that in a matter of a fairly short period of time, at when he was seven years old, he would have the thinking capacity of a 35-year-old man. Okay. He was told over this period of time that he would have a very, very difficult life if he chose to carry forth with, with work that would come for him later in life. It would be very painful and difficult, but that he had uh, chosen this in you know, in, in another sense, and of course this was further explained, and we can, what we were talking about is that this was something that Billy's spirit, if you will, had taken on, and not only in this life, but in previous lives, to play this role out as a, if you just want to use the word a herald or a prophet or what have you. Now a lot of people are troubled by that, and they, they get very angry when they hear that because it has either religious connotations or people think that uh, this means a special exalted position. Anybody who in history has ever played the role of a genuine prophet uh, has either ended up uh, having their head lopped off or their hands nailed to a cross or what have It's a very thankless job, and it goes on that way. Now, what we know from the material, what is said in here, is prophets appear on all developing uh, planets where human life, or I should say planets where human life is developing and where it becomes necessary and appropriate for humans to start to learn a little bit more about spiritual truth. Generally, in the course of development, for whatever peculiar reason, uh, people don't like to find out some of this stuff and will gen generally tend to uh, rebel, reject, want to stay with uh, superstitions or cultic beliefs, and when prophets come, uh, they have a very, very, very hard time and uh, it's a thankless job, and it has to go on over the course of history until humans are mature enough to start to pay attention and look at the information and not deify human beings, not make them into gods, and lots of other errors that these people say we and others humans have, have made uh, from time immemorial in the course of evolution. So Billy is a five, seven-year-old boy, nine, what have you. He's having these experiences. He doesn't tell anybody except one man. He can't speak to his family about it, but he does speak to a, a pastor or, or a parish priest, a man whose name was Mr. Zimmerman, or Pastor Father Zimmerman, and this man somehow knew, and he may have himself had some contact telepathically only, but he told young Edward to not be afraid and to go ahead and to have these experiences that they were not harmful, they were going to be good for him. So over the course of, of years, while Meyer is having these <laughs> unusual to say the least uh, experiences and learning things it is putting him at odds with reality as he knows it in day to day life with people in school he becomes very odd in his behavior and he's trying to cope with this development he becomes delinquent truant they, they put him in you know juvenile detention or whatever the version of that in Switzerland he ends up at, later on even in a psychiatric position they throw him in jail I mean he's had a very very difficult life he's He's traveled all over uh, most of the world with the exception of America and perhaps a couple other places. And he's had maybe 300 different, you know, occupations, and including he, he'd been in the French Foreign Legion when he was a teenager and escaped from it by marching across the desert. It's one of those, you know, great stories. Uh, he's been a snake charmer and a private detective. You know, you name it, the guy 
was doing it in the course of traveling around. He also studied all the major religions of the, of the world. He, he was in different ashrams and temples and uh, knew different people. He's met all sorts of people. He met Saddam Hussein. I mean, just all, you name it, the guy seems to have gone through it. So here's a man going through these experiences, and then his uh, you know, early contacts with this man cease at a certain point. He says that the way they would, that this man contacted him would be telepathically. He would hear his voice in his head calling him. Uh, you know, after and they trained him how to hear this and how to respond and come out. And all he said, and after a while, the voice grew very dim, and he no longer heard from him, and he knew that the man no longer was alive. Later on, some years after that, he's contacted by a woman whose name is Asket or Asket A S K E T, and she actually doesn't come from our own universe, but so it said, comes from a parallel neighboring physical universe. She is related, um, in some senses, to these people from whom Svas came, these Pleiadian or Pleiaran people. But she has a mission of taking him on different journeys and teaching him different things and giving him advanced information. We're talking 1956, I believe, here. So she interacts with him, and when you read some of the stuff that's in the contact notes in, in Guido's book, you, you know, there's just so much here you're, you're scratching your head, could this be true? I mean, it's just like it's beyond science fiction and all, but yes, here's, here's all this other data that you can take to the bank. How, how do you reconcile it? Well, her contacts stop at a certain point, and he gets handed off, if you will, in 1975 to this woman, Semyaze, the Pleiadian or Playaran woman, and that's when the official contacts begin that are covered in these contact notes. And that's when the information is given to him about all sorts of things. For instance, there's one from the 31st contact in July of 1975. It's on the second page of, of this document in here, where she uh, is talking to him in the ship. And in the course of the confirmation, they're talking about mountains and stuff. And he says, well, something about, well, that, I think it's when they're looking at Venus. And she's, he says something about, well, that's almost as high as the highest mountain on Earth, Mount Everest. And she says to him, well, that's not accurate. And he says, What's, what do you mean? Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on Earth. She says, well, not really. You have to measure from the center of the planet if you want to get a true measurement of all the mountains because of sea level stuff, blah, blah. There's a Mount Chimborazo in, um, I think it's in Peru or Ecuador or someplace. And they just casually mention me saying, well, I'm not so sure about it. She says, trust me, this is it. So I did a little search on the Internet, and the earliest thing I could find was in 1996, an issue of Earth magazine. Twenty-one years later, there's a little mention of the highest mountain on Earth is now determined to be Mount Chimborazo. You have to measure from the center of the planet. That's just like one of those little tidbits in there. At the same contact, this is when Meyer was taken to Venus, and... She is, uh, Samyaze is describing to him, giving him information about Venus that was unknown at the time. And this included a composition of atmospheric gases, the surface temperatures, the depth of the cloud. There was a cloud bank, and there was a specific figure that he's mentioning here of 40 kilometers. Uh, and it, it, this wasn't known until at the earliest it was known was known by the Soviet several months later in October 1975, but main corroboration came in August of 1976 when the U.S. published information from the probe, and it basically talked about a 40-kilometer cloud bank. I mean, you start to go, wait a minute, 1975, what was I doing? Uh, I hadn't come up with the information about Venus, and I hadn't covered Jupiter either, and I hadn't covered the stuff about the, uh, you know, the ozone damage. Oh, this is getting troublesome. So... This is the kind of stuff you find in here. And, again, what's the point? Why would they bother? And I come back to my own little theory here, which is they would like to see us survive the times we're in. And let's not pussyfoot around here. They have identified what they believe are the main challenges to our survival. We, unfortunately, uh, as a nation, our policies play a huge part in that. So the bottom line here is is that uh, he was receiving information telepathically as well as being transported to different places, as well as having information implanted in him. Right. Okay. All right, I'm going to take a short break, and uh, we'll be back in about eight or nine after. So if you want to step away from the phone for a couple minutes, get a drink of water or whatnot, 
me do so. I'll go oil my mouth. There you go. <laughs> That's fine. It's very interesting stuff here. We get a lot. I'm sure we do. <laughs> All right. We'll be back to the Lou Gentilly Show. Like I said, about 8 or 9 after. show tonight is sponsored by International Broadcasting Corporation, ticker symbol IBCS. Checking out on the web, people, ibcmedia.com. Stock is on the move. Not much stock left under six. Ticker symbol IBCS. Phone lines are sponsored by northstar-technologies.com. 3.9 cents per minute. If you're not paying that, people, then I think you're uh, getting ripped off, so you better look into it. Anyway, northstar-technologies.com. We'll be back right after this. When we come back, we're going to be taking your calls toll-free, 1-800-594-9270. That's Tapes for two payments of twenty nine ninety five plus shipping. Call one eight hundred two two one two four zero zero. That's one eight hundred two two one twenty four hundred. Hey, who's over there? Call movie fan, right? Yeah, talk so. You know how you can get them on a PC or a laptop right now? Yeah, instant call movies. Delivered on demand via the internet. And no waiting for no downloads. No few humongous files getting dumped on your hard drive. Forget about it. Know what else? You can have it all for one price per month. That's right. They call it cultmoviesonline.com. They got tons of that rare and unusual film stuff. It's to die for. Yeah, <laughs> cultmoviesonline.com. They got horror movies, science fiction, exploitation, bada boom, bada bing, erotica. <laughs> That's right, baby. They got uh, pop culture, fantasy, and more. All for only six ninety five a month. Shows, essays, if you're bored while watching them same old movies from the video store or on the cable, check them out on the website. Yeah, watch full length feature films streaming right into your computer with no fuss, no muss. And hey, no popcorn already, all right? Hey, cultmoviesonline.com. Unlimited access. Cultmoviesonline.com. Six ninety five a month. Cancel your subscription at any time. Unused demand. Unused PC. Cultmoviesonline.com. <laughs> a division of International Broadcasting Corporation. A publicly traded company. Ticker symbol IBCS. Do it now before the price goes up. Do you scare easily? No? Good. Then we invite you to turn on your radio, turn off your light, and join us here at The Chris Mill. The 
Krishna radio series is now available on CD. Each volume features three full-cast audio tales of the supernatural. Only $9.95 at www.amfmtheater.com. That's www.amfmtheater.com. Did you know that media mogul Ted Turner's net worth is estimated at $5 billion? Listen to his success story and how Wall Street played an important role. In 1971, with little or no money, Ted Turner merged his small billboard company into a publicly traded company called Rice Broadcasting. Creatively capitalizing on the situation, Ted Turner was able to access capital and build a media empire that began with the very first superstation, WTBS. This was only the beginning. Turner went on to create CNN the Cartoon Network, and Turner Film Classics. After an unsuccessful attempt to take over CBS television, Turner Broadcasting was acquired by AOL Time Warner, one of the largest media conglomerates in the world. Fortunes were made for those early shareholders of Rice Broadcasting that chose to participate. Like most things in life, those who get in at the earliest level stand to profit the most if the right opportunity presents itself. Check out International Broadcasting Corporation, a publicly traded company, ticker symbol IBC. International Broadcasting has three divisions, each focused on a niche market in the areas of broadcasting and Internet content. One of the most exciting ventures of the company is the creation of the IBC Radio Network, a 24-7 all-talk radio channel. The network is rapidly growing and gaining worldwide recognition for its unique shows, like Stock Talk Live, believed to be the very first business radio talk show focused exclusively on live, continuous coverage of microcap stocks throughout the entire stock market day. Other shows include The Lou Gentilly Show, a paranormal radio talk show covering a wide range of paranormal subjects like UFOs and alien abductions, government cover-ups, and haunting. Talk Show America is the home of entertaining, informative, and riveting political conservative talk radio. Are you a night owl? Don't miss Late Night Extreme Talk, a live call-in talk show from Las Vegas, Nevada, exploring some of the hottest issues of our day, news, politics, entertainment, and much more. So if you're looking for a unique investment opportunity, check out International Broadcasting Corporation, ticker symbol IBCS. Remember, investing is risky. As with all investments, you should consult with a financial advisor before getting involved. This announcement is paid for by IBCS and is not a solicitation to buy or sell security. Always read the prospectus before making any investment decision. You could lose some or all of your money. You could make money, too. For more information, visit the website at www.ibcmedia.com. That's www.ibcmedia.com. All right, listen up, you primitive screwheads. This is Bruce Campbell. You are listening to the Lou Gentilly Show. So listen up. When you're ready to get serious about radio broadcasting, Raduga is the simple, affordable solution. Raduga Broadcasting Software is the radio industry standard. It's perfect for commercial station formats and Internet radio broadcasts. Raduga is simple to use and easy to understand. Raduga plays nearly any format of audio file. You can build rotations in your own playlist, play jingles and bumpers with a single mouse click. Extremely dependable, beta tested, runs flawlessly with no lockups and no freezing. 100% reliability. They even have a free trial version for your evaluation. So when you're ready to get serious about radio broadcasting, Raduga is the simple, affordable solution. For more information, visit their website at www.raduga.net. That's R-A-D-U-G-A dot net. Attention inventors, need a patent? Then you need Inventech, the launch pad for new ideas. Inventech understands the needs of inventors like you. And only Inventech offers a free new product market analysis. It's the first step towards a patent and marketing success. Call 1-800-598-8181. That's 1-800-598-8181. With your market analysis, receive a free video and learn the secrets the pros use to take it to the next level. Be first to the marketplace while your idea is still high. 
not. With our worldwide experience, InventTech can turn your idea into reality. Learn if your idea has the right stuff for marketing success. It's free. Don't let this opportunity slip away. Call now and receive your free analysis, free marketing info, and a free video. Take that all-important first step towards turning your dream into reality. Call 1-800-598-8181 to receive your free package loaded with info. That's 1-800-598-8181. Call now. Welcome back to the Lou Gentilly Show. Phone lines are now open. Call the Lou Gentilly Show toll free at 1 800 594 9270. And now, here's your host, Lou Gentilly. Don't forget, uh, August 15th through the 17th in uh, Hunt Valley, Maryland, I'll be appearing at the 2003 Horror Find Weekend, and uh, that's in Maryland. It's a really cool place, really great weekend we have there every year, and uh, a lot of celebrities there and people interacting with everybody and a lot of that horror, and Alice Cooper will be there. Everybody basically knows who he is, right? Tony Todd, the actual Candyman in the movie The Candyman, David Naughton from American Werewolf in London, Bill Mosley from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Ken Forey, who played in Dawn of the Living Dead, my buddy Reggie Bannister, who played in Phantasm, Doug Bradley, Gunnar Hansen from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. By the way, Doug Bradley's from uh, Hellraiser, if I didn't just say that. Um, some people from the cast of The Night of the Living Dead. Uh, another good buddy of mine, Michael Berryman from These Hills Have Eyes, and uh, Tracy Lords, Count Gore, and the Ladies of the Evil Dead, and many, many more. Anyway, that's uh, that's coming up um, the 15th through the 17th of August. Check it out, horrorfindweekend.com. That's horrorfindweekend.com. And more information about the Penn State Conference uh, that I'll be at, Paranormal Conference 2003 will be posted up on the show so you can buy tickets and get a hotel room up there in State College, PA, for only 44 bucks. Can't go wrong. Anyway, check out our website, lougentile.com. That's L-O-U-G-E-N-T-I-L-E.com for the latest in paranormal news, as well as over 2,800 paranormal photographs, videos, and audio files, nine independent Internet streams, if you listen to us over the net, as well as uh, two video feeds, see what's going on in the studio, and... Uh, Free archives, live shows, everything else. Everything's free on the site. And uh, there's people in the chat. If you want to go into the chat room and chat away, there's uh, people in there as well as myself. And uh, get on the mailing list. Sign the guest book. Anyway, very, very interesting here tonight. Very, very interesting. We're talking about uh, And Yet They Fly, which is basically exploring the Billy Meyer contact, or contact, shall I say. We're speaking tonight with uh, Michael Horn. He's a researcher, producer, author, and uh, it's been pretty interesting so far. I suggest if you're listening in over the net or you have Internet access, you, you go to the site, because we're going to be talking about it uh, you know, over the course of the next uh, hour or two. And yet they fly dot com. That's and yet they fly dot com. And uh, you can see some really amazing UFO pictures in the UFO picture gallery, as well as a lot of uh, the scientific proof that the Billy Meyer case is real. Fascinating stuff. Check it out. Anyway, we are back now. Welcome back, sir. Thank you. I'm discombobulated here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's take a, a quick call here. You're on Lou Gentilly Show. Who am I speaking with? Hi, this is Ken. Yes, Ken? Oh, hey, Lou. Uh, first of all, I want to applaud you and Mike uh, for presenting this information. It's, um, I think it's the most significant uh, extraterrestrial contact 
ever, you know, in, in modern history. Um, one of the things I, I guess I, I want to make one statement and then ask a question. Well, basically is this. Uh, I think a lot of people don't know that when you stand up there and you try to speak the truth, uh, which is contrary to what religions and governments want you to believe, that they generally try to take you out, assassinate you. And Billy Meyer has been the target of assassination, I believe the number is over 15 times. I want 19, to say 16 yeah. or 17. But I know it's over 15 times. 19. 19 times. And I liken Billy and, and you and, and, and really Michael to being like the, the character Neo in the movie The Matrix, who is trying to bring the truth to save humanity, and everywhere around him are Agent Smiths who are trying to stop him and, and shut him up and keep the truth of, of, what, of, of what could happen, that we could be free on Earth. We could have a great civilization and a great future. But, you know, the voice of truth is, is uh, it's very dim out there. And I, I, I just applaud you guys for, for being here and saying the things you're saying and trying hard to, to save the rest of us. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. So what, what's your question? So my question is, do you think, or do you or Michael, do you think that we have a chance, you know, of of turning around the agents of the Matrix and, and being the Neos of this world and win this battle for humanity? Mm. Um, take it from there, you know. Can we make it? Well, I'll, I'll throw my two cents in. Uh, I think the answer is yes. I, 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 of course, I can't prove it. It's going to take humanity, all of us, kind of everybody, even people like ourselves that are, you know, for peace in the world and all the lovely things. There's shifts we somehow have to make, and to be able to communicate to other people the importance and need of looking at, you know, this information is, is part of it. It doesn't take an extraterrestrial or Billy Meyer to tell us that we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. It's it's just that if indeed we have a body of information here that has impeccable credibility and it has been prescient or prophetically accurate and now they're laying out for us uh what the you know coming years, maybe even just months and years hold if we don't change, uh we all of us that become aware of it have perhaps our own obligation to do what we can to alter that negative course. I can't say anything particularly profound because I don't know. I think it's it's up to humanity. Hmm. Well, I think that um, things like the Disclosure Project, getting a lot of uh, these, these high-profile people who were in the military and from around the world coming forth and talking about what went on is helping a lot. I don't see I don't see anytime soon the reality of ETs and UFOs and whatnot coming into the mainstream. I would say maybe in five or ten years there might be some big movement towards it, but any, anything anything shorter than that, I, I think there's just too many factors in, involved right now, especially with the way the media portrays the paranormal and, and UFOs and right. and whatnot. But uh, I, I think it's coming. It's, it'll, it'll probably be here within ten years, and, and probably ten years from now you're going to look back at this and go, man, you know, that was, that was probably... Uh, it was an interesting conversation we had back then, and, uh, you know, here we are, and we, we know that we're not alone. Well, I would add to it, I don't think, for me, the Meyer case isn't even so much about UFOs and extraterrestrials. That's the, let's say that's the vehicle that came in, and it's, it's like saying that the Columbus case, uh, you know, quote-unquote, was about the you know, Santa Maria, the Pinta, and the Nina. That's the vehicle for the people that are, you know, the visitors, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's really the information and what we do with it, and that's why it is Meyer as an earth man, not some E.T. coming, you know, walking down the plank like Michael Rennie off of a UFO and making pronouncements. Uh, we don't need gods. We don't need uh, people to deify or to worship or be in awe of because we're only going to set in motion, as, you know, Ken was hinting at with cultic religions will form again or we're going to attack and kill these people, they're not going to land. Uh, my only issue with the Disclosure Project has been that they're still, in a sense, trying to prove 
to somebody and you know get people to get up there and, and state stuff and the, it's kind of like in a way you know and I do respect the effort and, and the intention but the, there's a part of it that says well we still need the government to admit something that's why for me the Meyer case is take a look at this figure it out if you get it if you understand that the most important event in human history actual contact between humans and extraterrestrials has already occurred it's been going on solid for 61 years well Maybe you don't need the government to tell you that it's okay to know something if you can come to that conclusion or to even think that it might be so. So while I, I know a lot of people have put their reputations on the line and there's a lot of flack for those military people that will get up and talk about it, this is a means by which anybody can simply go to their computer, do the homework, and, and draw the conclusion. I, I would agree. I, I'd just say one thing. You know, UFOs, ETs, ghosts, so they all fall in the same category. When too many people have an experience, there's something to it. Mm -hmm. And whether it's UFOs or ghosts or just the paranormal in general, there's something going on. Yes. And, and that's the bottom line. Yes, indeed. Okay. And it's what do we do with the information? What sure. you know? These there may be all sorts of things that don't fit into our current paradigm. Uh, let's say there are all sorts of things that are you know real and true. And if we say paranormal, those things that are real and that we occur, appear to be paranormal or simply that we have not yet discovered the mechanism or the laws by which they exist or how they operate, they're normal within the context. It's just like if somebody would have said 200 years ago people are going to fly to the moon, you're talking paranormal to them. That's not possible, and, of course, we now have that technology. I, I would just hope now that we can, with whatever the source is, take information and awaken to our own responsibility here on Earth. I, I will get into, if you want, in, in a little bit, we can get into the, frankly, more troubling stuff that's much more immediate than the page we've been discussing with all the previously validated scientific stuff. But if I may, let me just tell you that in, in June of 1994, for those that, that might be looking at this page of the scientific stuff, uh, Meyer was told that he had asked a question regarding the mad cow disease, and he was told, and this is the quote, the uh, pathogens cannot be destroyed by simply cooking the meat and other items or by producing meat meal. He was told the temperature is as high as 1,228 degrees Fahrenheit, possibly up to 1,768 degrees Fahrenheit for the previously mutated pathogens that have existed for some time now. Those temperatures are necessary to destroy them. When I last did a search, and it's been several months, on mad cow, we were upping, you know, we were seeing scientists upping the estimate of the temperatures because they're realizing that these uh, little proteins are not being destroyed. This is something that ultimately, here's one sitting in front of us, we may be able to go, well, at a certain point, how accurate was Meyer? Mm, looks like he was, he was on it. Uh, or maybe he will be shown to be wrong, or that they, they will be shown to be wrong. But there's just so much of this type of information. And uh, this is... This is the sum and substance of the case to me. It's, you know, it's less about the ETs than it is about us and mm -hmm. our survival. Mm -hmm. I hope you answered your question. Oh, that was great. Uh, I'm just listening, you know, and um, if you want to take another call, I just want to tell you thank you, okay. Lou and Michael, for thank you, Ken. great work. Not a problem. Have a good night. Okay. All right, bye-bye. 1-800-594-9270. That's 1-800-594-9270. You're on the Lou Gentilly Show. Who am I speaking with? This is Jeff from New Orleans. Yes, Jeff? I'd like to ask Michael, um... I heard Billy was shown a laser gun. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, I would. Um, in 1976 and in 1977, Billy was shown a uh, laser weapon. He was loaned that weapon. There, in the book, we have photographs of him holding it. We have the the hand and arm of the ET. They won't show their face. They don't want people taking pictures of their faces. But you see the gold spacesuit, uh, which was. Pretty sophisticated. If a Swiss farmer made it in 1976, he should be in Hollywood, you know. But let's get down to answering your question. Uh, that uh, weapon was loaned to Meyer on those two occasions. He took it and he plugged a hole through a tree on the property, an apple tree that was uh, kind of dormant or near dead. When the investigators came to check out the case and they were shown this hole in the tree, they at first thought maybe it was drilled, you know, maybe it was a, or a welding torch or something. So they examined the hole. They saw it was a perfectly round hole, clear through the tree, and that the in interior of this was smooth as glass. There were no apparent burn marks from a welding torch, no drilling marks, yet this thing was 
clean through, smooth as glass, and would have required enormous temperatures to have sealed off that interior surface, uh, probably the resins of the tree in that manner. Now, they also found that the tree was now had been revived. It was producing fruit again. On another occasion, either with that tree, I'm not totally clear on this, or with another tree, uh, some other people took a string through one of the, this whole thing, and they, uh, like a plumb line on a horizontal basis, they dragged the, the string through, and for as far as they could walk it in a straight line, every branch and you know leaf or whatever was that was in a straight line was singed clear through. I, I don't know if they went 100 or 200 yards or whatever. Meyer was told that this was a beam type of weapon that was actually a 600-year-old antique for these for these ETs, and that this weapon uh, produced a beam by combining two different elements to generate the beam. Now, this was in 76 and 77. Now, this was about the time that the earliest lasers, I think, were being developed, and indeed, uh, lasers have been developed that utilize the combination of, of two elements. As a matter of fact, in February of 2002, America launched a rocket with a, a death laser on it. It's called the COIL, and that's a chemical oxygen iodine laser, I believe. It's, it's the power of a chemical reaction between a couple of elements converted to laser energy. Now, this is a huge thing. You know, it's really pretty big. Meyer had a handheld version of this 20 Five years before, and indeed it was a two-element weapon, and they told him that it was operated in a combination of he could visualize or mentally uh, target something, and then there's a trigger to pull. It looks like a silly thing when you look at it. It looks like, is that just a toy or something? But indeed, there's also a video segment that we may also put out where he's kind of twirling in his hands and walking around with it, and uh, then you see this tree with a hole through it. So that's a little bit about the... Uh, the handheld laser. Wow. That's wild. Thanks. All right, thanks for calling. Sure. That's pretty wild. It is. It is indeed. Um, this is, you know, Meyer also was taken on board not only uh, smaller ships, from which he has taken photographs, some of which are on our website, andyetheyfly.com, but he was taken on board what they called the Great Space or I guess we would call it a mother ship that was something like 10 miles in diameter, a full living environment, almost like a mini planet. And he saw android-type beings, robotic beings, even semi-human, semi-machine beings built into councils that operated equipment that looked like a torso. He described it as a torso of a man type of being with arms and hands that was operating things that was apparently built into this uh, council. You're talking about stuff from the 70s he was describing. Now, are these pictures on your on your site under the UFO picture gallery? We have pictures uh, that he took of other discs from a disc above Switzerland. We don't have pictures from inside the the, uh, the mothership. Uh, the, you know, it's, that'll have to remain. In, I, I, there's two categories here for me. There's the speculative and the and the factual. A lot of the information in the case, I have to simply say. Well, it's speculative because we have not either proved or disproved it. Right. So if we speak about a mothership and all this stuff, well, you know, can we prove that? No. So am I going to hang my hat on that? No. But what if we have pictures taken above Switzerland with two UFOs, you know, next to the ship he's in? Well, uh, by golly, what do you do with that? <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you can yell and scream all you want, but um, there it is. So... This is the kind of thing. I mean, Meyer was writing in the 251st Contact, and he was talking about people being biochipped, and that this would be ultimately very dangerous if we allowed it. It would be these chips would be linked to DSP satellites, ultimately to a supercomputer in Brussels, and that this could be very, very um, corrupting for human freedom on an enormous level. And we know already that in the past year, year and a half, this has started. You know, they've done some things with animals, and there's some children, an innocuous thing. You know, this is going to help people. But he warned. He said, if this happens and people buy this, that is the beast. Wow. There is the, the, the Brussels supercomputer. There's the beast, and there's the mark of the beast. You get chipped, and now you're tied into that. Uh, I'm sure other people have probably thought about that, too, but, you know, he was writing about it. All right, let's, uh, let's take a couple more calls, oh, and then sure. we'll, uh, we'll go into some more about what we're speaking about tonight. You're on the Lou Gentilly Show. Who am I speaking with? Hello? Hello? Didn't disturb him here. Oh, well. You're on the Lou Gentilly Show. Who am I speaking with? Uh, it's Jay. Yes, sir? Yes, hi. Uh, 
I just wanted to uh, congratulate Michael. Uh, I'm pretty sure he knows who I am. I usually email him a couple oh, yeah. times. Oh, yeah. Hi, Jay. Nice to <laughs> hear your going. voice. Um, I'm located in New York right now, so uh, I'm sort of like getting a bad feedback here. Uh, I just wanted to mention to um, people in the show that uh, the you know I, I've been involved pretty much with the Fiju uh, information, the Billy Mike case, since 1986. And I must say that I have done my research very well and this is the closest thing we can get to reality in any part of the in any part of the world. I uh, just want to just uh, congratulate you for being in the show, and uh, and you know you're doing a great job. Oh, thank you, I appreciate it. Glad to hear a voice to the name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I, um, I have one question though. Uh, one one question that just puzzles me for a very long time is that uh, you know being that we all are involved with the Billy my case as a whole in a group, how is it possible for us to ever get the governments of America, for instance, to actually open their minds somewhat from the brainwashing that we've been uh, living and make them see at least open their minds to just to explore this on the side for themselves or, or even, let's say, President Bush. Mm. Uh, be able to uh, uh, look into this and see the reality of, of the Billy Meyer case, and even possibly uh, have Billy have meet you know meet up with any other governments and right. people. Yeah, that's, that's well, let me answer a little bit. Uh, jump back a little. I do understand that some years ago, and I don't know exactly how many, an offer was made, and I believe it was to the U.S. government by the ETs to have open contact, and the condition was that Billy would be the intermediary. Yes. It, the government in question, again, I think it was the U.S., declined. They wouldn't let Billy. It would have to be the president or, you know, somebody who had an ego in there. Yes. The answer, as, as I see it to your regular question here, is just by people coming to check the material out themselves, writing to people, calling, faxing, emailing, you know, because this is a, it's a, it's going to be one of those little groundswell movements. You're not going to probably have a sudden realization on the part of uh, people who have a lot invested in reality staying untampered with. Uh, they're, they're not going to suddenly embrace something that they could uh, dismiss as paranormal and, you know, nonsense and what have you. So credible human beings who check out the information for themselves and say, hey, wait a minute, you're my government, uh, and you're the officials, and we've elected you, and you people need to start taking a look at this. You either show us that this is not so, disprove this, or, or uh, don't you think we better open this up for a little more scrutiny? I, I'm just going about it in my way. I mean, there's other people doing it. I've, I've kind of done my work in the sense I did the research, I posted it. Other right. people can come forward and do interviews and discuss it, and I think it has to be just kind of like a, you know, a, you know, a kind of groundswell movement on this case and uh, especially because I, I think the material is so important uh, come forward and talk to people send them I, I try to contact people all the time the hardest thing to do is to get on some of the mainstream uh, radio shows let alone television forget about it almost <laughs> you know because right. people are so inv I have actually talked to producers from from the main major TV magazine shows okay. initially they're, they're blown away then they say, well, we're not, we're not doing that kind of a story. I said, so if the most important event in human history could be proved, if I, I'll put up money. I mean, I, you can throw whatever you want at me. I can prove this case is real. You know, just like if we went into court, I can make the case. Correct. Well, we're doing another thing right now. I mean, it's like a bad dream. It is. Nightmare. You know, it's very strange because it almost feels very similar to the case in, in, in Bible history uh, of, of uh, you. you know, the so-called... Jesus Christ, who uh, was slandered, and, and 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 they were not accepting of him. And meanwhile, the same information was passed on to him. And and uh, it's pretty much it's pretty much happening like a deja vu. It's it's happening now after yeah. two thousand years. It's yeah, happening and all over again. And, and over. there's got to be a different kick that we need to use to uh, open the minds of some of these powerful government uh, people, agencies that can. Uh, Someone give that a chance, or even the scientific community as a whole, uh, you know, to open this up for right. the whole planet as a whole. And that's pretty much what I wanted to say tonight. Well, thank you. I think one thing I would say is maybe 
as we uh, we get into what's called the Enoch prophecies here, which are you know the less pleasant stuff, uh, that may be the kind of thing that might motivate people. I mean, it's a little scary, but maybe it would motivate people to go to the governments, and maybe it would also motivate people in government to start taking another look. Uh, just as an example of a couple things, and, I, and then I think maybe I should talk about what's in there, but one of the things, and we'll find out if this is, proves to be true or not, uh, April 2nd, Meyer apparently had a contact with one of the ETs whose name is Quetzal, and said that the SARS epidemic, your disease that we see now, mm-hmm. is due to a laboratory accident in the Chinese province, Guangdong. <laughs> oh, why did that sound so familiar to me? <laughs> Does it? As well as releasing this virus, which is, of course, concealed by the Chinese government. In other words, this was a laboratory accident in China. It got loose. And uh, this, we will get a published contact report on that at some point, hopefully in the near future. Meyer also wrote an interesting thing about the peace symbol. And what he said was that a couple things about peace demonstrations. Now, the, obviously, the Playharans and Meyer are talking about obvious, you know, peace is the most important thing we could bring to our planet. But what they've said is that the people in power don't really pay attention to peace demonstrations. They actually get emboldened by them, and that an error that's being made by the peace movement is that the peace symbol is upside down. That that vertical line with the two angled lines yes. in the circle represents symbolically a militant energy, uh, almost like a sword, a challenging energy, That, but when you invert it, when you turn the symbol upside down, it's the tree of life. Okay. It's an open arms, or you know, the, a, a torch of hope, whatever you want to call it, that that is a symbol that it goes into the subconscious as a peace symbol. And interestingly enough, it reminded me that some years ago, a physician, I believe his name is John Diamond, did research on things that strengthen and deplete the immune system, and he had he even tested affirmations and different things. He showed that different lines and different shapes could either bring one's energy down or raise it, and that the gesture of open arms, uplifted or opened arms, inspires and lifts the energy, strengthens the immune system. And it, when you look at the peace symbol turned the other way, up, you know, upside down, that is that upward energy that we're trying to bring forward. So that's in the for what it's worth department. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's very much involved with the subatomic level of the energies within the, the atom mm. that creates the, uh, the effect of strengthening your body. It's just like how you can make yourself sick by just having bad thoughts. Yes. It's the same energy level. It's, it, 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 it all works within the the atomic structure of your DNA, and pretty much as a whole, these are just a lot of the details that the Plagarians have given us in the contact notes. I'm, I'm for one that I, you know I, I'm for one 100 percent to what they have done for the past you know 70 or uh, you know 8,000 years yeah. of, the, of their of their uh, intervention or, or, or light intervention in our world, and, you know, they consider us, their, you know, as cousins or part family. Right. You know, and we, we're supposed to partake of what they know, and that's a pity. That's really the uh, uh, a real very pitiful thing that in this world that we're living in now, it, it's everyone is questioning the religions, questioning the governments, and, and so on, you know. Mm-hmm. Exactly. All right. Thank you for the Got call. Got it. Thank you, Jay. Okay, Michael. Take care. Good to speak with you. All righty. Good night. 1-800-594-9270. That's 1-800-594-9270. You know, while we were, we were talking, I was listening, and at the same time, I was viewing uh, a lot of the UFO photos that are up on your site, and they they fly, or and yet they fly dot com. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- these are really. These are really some fascinating photos. Oh, yeah. They really are. One thing that stands out, I mean, these aren't really necessarily big craft either. Some of the formations in the grass would maybe indicate that they could be somewhere around maybe four or five feet wide. Well, actually, no. Uh, The the indentations in the grass are from the uh, triangular positioned landing uh, pads or the energy that's generated on the ship from those structures. The ships, uh, for the most part, that we're seeing in these photographs 
were about 21 feet in diameter or so. Okay. Some, uh, there were some called telemeter disks, a little smaller. There are other larger ships, clearly, but for the most part, these that are in this photo gallery, and let's remember these were taken between 75 and 79 by a one-armed man, <laughs> you know, uh, good luck faking this kind of stuff. Um, these are not teeny, but they're not really huge. Okay. Yeah. And um, do you, did anybody else have another question, or do you want me to? Uh, we, we want to take another call? Oh, sure. Okay. I want to see if we can find out what people want to know about this. Okay. You're on the Lou Gentilly Show. Who am I speaking with? Nora. What's your name? Tina. We Tina. Both. Okay. I was curious, who is trying to kill Billy? That's one question. And the other question is, where can I go to find out more information about these energy-raising symbols? Energy-raising symbols. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll try to tell you about that. Uh, in terms of who's trying to kill Billy, well, that's a good one, um, or a bad one as the case may be. Yeah. There have uh, not been too many people identified. There, in, in I think one or maybe two cases, he did meet the people. There was some people who actually uh, kind of came back to, if you will, kind of repent on the whole thing and apologize for it. It seems like the thrust of it is that there are some people who were very religious who felt terribly disturbed by what he was doing and saying, and then there is information that, that some of the attempts have been from much higher levels, more organized levels, secret services, and, you know, government, uh, and they did not identify whom, but some perhaps from, let's just say, secret services, intelligence operations from uh, different parties that don't want this to be known and they don't want Billy to be out there doing it because it's very threatening to the establishment uh, and to the structures that we have on this planet, economic, financial, religious, political, military. If, if you have human beings that operate outside of all of this and the masses of humanity have to deal with that as a reality, they fear, uh, you're, you're, the powers that be fear that this would be very destabilizing. You can have compassion for that point of view because if you're a, someone in government, let's just say, uh, and you, you worry about riots in the streets that people feel like you know they're going to be threatened by extraterrestrials, that's why there's no real landings and, and sightings that are going to flip people out like that. But it's a, it's a gradual indoctrination of the reality of other life so that it started probably in the 50s, you know, and we have it in cartoons and TV shows and commercials and movies, and you name it, so that we can kind of let the idea perk through our consciousness in a way that doesn't threaten us quite as much as, oh, my gosh, there's other people, they're here, we can't control them. Are they going to hurt us? Now, if, that, if that's kind of a take on that, let me go to your uh, thing about these symbols, the book. I believe the, the guy is named John Diamond, and... Um, you would find books by him, Doctor. I think his name is Dr. John Diamond. You might have to search. Uh, in, in case I'm wrong, you can email me on the And Yet They Fly website, and I can try and find it. But he did a lot of work with affirmations and healing. He had a whole list for every organ in the body and everything like that. It was very interesting, and they used kinesiology to test these things. Now, I'm not telling you that. I don't know that it's all true, but uh, it seems to be pretty interesting and uh, some of the stuff I've seen correlation for over the years, since my other work has a lot to do with just uh, healing work and uh, fitness and what have you, and I, I work with a, my senior citizens, my terrestrial elders, if you will. So um, I hope that helps you find it. And as I say, there's a, a mailing link on And Yet They Fly. If you have a problem, drop me an email, and I'll try and find it. Okay. Thank right. you very much. Thanks for the call. Good night. Okay. Um, we're going to just hold calls for right now, and uh, are you able to stay the next hour? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, we'll take calls at uh, the beginning of the next hour. Let's uh, let's go into, now, what were you talking about before the? The Enoch prophecies. There you go, Enoch prophecies. Yeah. That sounded kind of disturbing. What, what's yeah, the well, that's why we're going to kind of ease into it. <laughs> uh, and, of course, uh, as we ease into it, we can, we can say um, this is simply information. Uh, you you can take it with a grain of salt. In a reasonably short period, we hope to actually 
have the official, uh, you know, approved translation published for people so that you can um, check it out for yourself. Um, in the meantime, what I'll do is I'm going to I'm going to open up the file here while we're talking, and I'll I'll bring it up, and we'll uh, we'll deal with it. And it let me give you this background. I first read the prophecies from 1981. I read them in 86 or 87, shortly after I got the first documentation. So I know that this stuff was was written way back then. Okay. However, some of this was updated, and I'm going to just go through this in bits and pieces. I'm not going to read all the pages verbatim, but I'm going to hit the stuff that's kind of going to jump out for better or for worse. Now, with prophecies, most of it you're going to hear is for worse because they're trying to warn us. You don't have to warn people about good stuff. You warn them about things that are markers for, for trouble and for problems. Right. So in this Enoch prophecy, uh, Meyer was having another contact in 1987 in which they again gave him the Enoch prophecies with the updated information so that they would be released starting in January of 2003, they said would be the time when he should go about disseminating them if you know for people who want to pay any attention they were not real optimistic that humanity was going to embrace the suggestions uh you know contained herein and the the whole drift which is to avoid the things in here so i'll i'll just jump in some i'll read verbatim some i'll just kind of paraphrase if there's anything you want me to clarify or read verbatim just have me do that okay now, one of the things that is said is the time at which these prophecies are going to begin to be fulfilled will be when there is no longer a pope in Rome. Now, I'll get a little more on that, but let me state that the prophecies, though I'm going to read this document or the pieces of it sequentially, it is not in chronological order. They deliberately don't do that, and in the prophecies they don't give dates for the most part with the exception of the suggestion about World War III, which I'll get to. But they give things out of sequence, so we're not running around trying to just stop an event, but rather reorganize our thinking and our action. They're talking about the whole of Europe falling into a, a great deal of, of trouble from what they call evil powers, and we'll specify that in a bit. They're saying that the Christian religion is going to collapse, and the churches and monasteries as well will be ruined and destroyed, and that there will be tremendous harm that will come to the structure of the church and the the officials of the church in time, that this is going to result if we do not change things in up to two-thirds of humanity ultimately losing their lives. So that's a heavy warning. They're going to talk about the countries of the East rising up against the countries of the West and the West against the East, and that there's going to be enormous damage from various weapons. Now, some of this, remember, from this was actually originally written in '81. And they're talking about laser weapons and atomic, biological, and chemical. If we get time during this conversation, we'll go back to an early document from 2,000 years ago that actually covers some of this, even to the degree of missiles and weaponry and all, and it's an amazing thing. And it was published in 1970, and Myers connected to it. So let me go. They've spoken about the fact that there's going to be two more popes uh, and let me, I'll lead up to it. What they're talking about, they're saying that the fanatics of Islam will rise up and cover the lands of Europe with war. All is going to shake and quiver. England will be conquered and brought down to the lowest kind of misery. And the fanatics and warmongers of Islam will retain their power for a long time. However, not only Europe will be affected, but ultimately all the countries and people of the world will become involved as this could expand to a worldwide war. After the turn of the millennium, papal power will exist for only a short time longer. Pope John Paul II is the third from last of his position. After him, a further pope will follow, and then what they call a Pontifex Maximus, who is going to be known as Petrus Romanus. Now, some other people may have as well predicted this, and we don't know if this will happen yet, but this is prophecy. Okay. But they're saying that during his rule and under his rule, this is when the Catholic Church is going to find its end. And this is when so much of these other, uh, you know, events are going to come upon people. They are saying that this is going to be due to genetic engineering and atomic biolo biological and chemical weapons. Now, I should say that genetic engineering per se is not an evil, contrary to the way people may feel about it. It is a necessary step in evolution. 
advancement science. It's just that it's going to be used to develop cloned fighting machines, according to this, from 81 and 87. I mean, imagine them talking about it then. Now, what they're talking about here is a tremendous aggression and destruction, and they say the USA will head this along with all the other Western capitalist countries, invading the Eastern lands while simultaneously having to repel the Eastern intruders. Overall, America will play the most significant role. In the guise of peacemaker and fighter of terrorism, America will invade many lands of the earth, bomb everything and wreck destruction, and bring a thousandfold death to the population. The military policies of the USA will know no limits, and the objective of the economic as well as other policies will continue to be, as, it, as has been the case for a long time, to build and operate a world police force. Now, again, let's just say this is 8187. Does it sound even slightly familiar as to what's happening during these times? Well, here we go. They're talking about that this was not going to suffice because in the guise of so-called peaceful globalization, this term is used again, which has only recently really been introduced into our uh, political awareness. But they say, in the guise of so-called peaceful globalization, American politics will aspire to absolute world power in the form of economic supremacy, which will provide a possible argument for starting a third world war if people as a whole do not finally strive for reason and take the required steps against the delusional machinations of their governments and military powers as well as their secret services and stop the power of irresponsible ones in charge within all areas. If they do not, many peoples, great and small, will lose their independence and their cultural identity and will be beaten be beaten down because the USA will gain dominance over them and force them under its thumb with terrible might. At first, now think about this that follows, at first many countries will howl with the US wolves partly out of fear of American aggression and sanctions, including many irresponsible ones of Switzerland and Germany, as well as other countries. But others will join in because they will be somehow forced to do so or will be misguided by irresponsible promoters of American propaganda. Sounds pretty harsh against us, but wait, these folks are equal opportunity offenders. We'll get to the others. But let's <laughs> you know, get to this first. Okay. Eventually, however... Many Asian, African, and European countries will rise up against the American hegemony when they recognize that the USA is only taking advantage of them for purposes of war, conquest, and exploitation. In this way, many lands will initially become puppet states of America before reason and, Amer and awareness emerge in the responsible members of governments and in much of the population, and a turning away from the USA ensues. Now, that's you know, pretty harsh stuff. And, you know, I'm speaking here in terms of, in this country, we are Americans. Uh, that's not easy stuff for me to either hear or let alone read, and people are going, you know, what is this, anti-Americanism? These people have no particular investment. Let's also remember Meyer Swiss, the, you know, the epitome of the neutral land, even though he points out that the Swiss also are going to, in some ways, fall in, and this just happened. I don't know if you're aware, but the Swiss government allowed the flyover of American military and military medical planes, which is a violation of their own neutrality. And Meyer pointed it out. Now, this was written 81, 87, but there it goes. Now, do you want me to continue on this? Or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in addition, apocalyptic natural catastrophes will appear which will reduce the whole of Europe to terror and destabilization. But despite this, Europe will continue to exist even though it will have suffered enormous destruction. This following stuff ain't pleasant. It will be a different case in the far west, in the United States of America, which will be a completely annihilated land. There will be many reasons for this. With its global conflicts, which will suddenly break out and will continue into the far future, America is generating enormous hatred against itself in many countries. As a result, enormous catastrophes will be visited upon America that will reach heretofore barely imaginable proportions. The destruction by terrorists of the WTC, the World Trade Center, will only be the beginning. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
Reread yeah. re -read that again. As a result, enormous catastrophes will be visited upon America that will reach heretofore barely imaginable, propor imaginable proportions. The destruction by terrorists of the WTC, the World Trade Center, will only be the beginning. That's in this document from 1987. And it has not been altered in any way. Uh, all I can say is this warning was from the 87 version. They did not have that in the 81, although they talked about destruction here already in 81. I read it in 86, and I'm going, wow, what's this about? Now they put in the thing about the terrorism. They say that it's not only going to be the destruction won't only be through uh, ABC weapons, laser and other de unbelievably deadly and destructive weapons, cloned murder machines, etc., but as a consequence of the irresponsible humans of Earth, nature and the deepest depths of the maltreated world will rise up and wreak havoc as well as bring death over the earth, which could not be more worse. Enormous firestorms and gigantic hurricanes will sweep over the USA and bring devastation, destruction, and annihilation, the likes of which have never happened before as long as anyone could remember. We have been, uh, now I'm leaving it to say, we have been warned by Meyer and many other people about this HARP project, weather modification, chemtrails and all this other stuff the universe operates on laws of cause and effect when you send the pendulum out sooner or later it's coming back now let me just say something about having read that thing about the world trade center and all this stuff that they're saying will happen here if we don't change our ways that's not easy stuff to read especially in light of something that they believe people have to understand they are against open border immigration and immigration. They believe that when you live in a country, you don't simply flee for economic benefit and all of that. You have a duty to your country to improve it, to solve its problems. I'm an American. Lots of the people that are involved in studying this material are Americans. It gives me no pleasure to be reading this, and people can say, well, it's a hoax or whatever you want. But this is, involves me and my family and my neighbors and you and your family, if it's true. If it's not, it's just a bad joke played by some Swiss guy who happens to have some abilities that we can't figure out. But this is what's in this material, and this is why in the beginning of our conversation I said it's not so much about UFOs and extraterrestrials. They've established a 30-year record of credibility uh, on an impeccable level with prescient, uh, prophetically accurate information there is a reason for it. They're trying to warn us about something if we choose to be wise enough to heed it. And that is very much what is contained in this information right now. There is more. Do you want me to continue or, or wait till after the break? Well, we're, uh, we're, uh, we've got a couple minutes left. But okay. This is, Here this we is some pretty disturbing stuff. It here. is, and we can talk about it. And if people are disturbed and they want to yell or ask questions or anything, I'm in it with you. I'm not leaving here. This is my yeah. country. I want to help fix it so this doesn't happen and whatever. Okay. Not only America, but also all other Western industrialized countries who, at the beginning of the new millennium, will still live in the delusion that they could dominate and rule over the underdeveloped nations, the third world countries, will not only soon lose their influence over these lands, but must also defend themselves against them. In truth, so say the Enoch prophecies, the industrial nations are not seen as true civilizations, but only as sham civilizations because they will trample all true love, true freedom and wisdom, as well as true peace under their feet ever so more toward the end of the 20th century and beginning of the new third millennium, along with all the values of humanity and true humaneness. But all that will not stop the USA from continuing to operate against all nations, even after all the wicked events. There's a break here where they, well, he talks here about, uh, it's a jump because I'm, as, as I'm saying, this doesn't go in a sequence. He says the 90s will bring not only a worldwide spread of AIDS, but also, lasting well into the new millennium, Epidemics such as the so-called mad cow disease, that is, BSE, and resultant from that also, different strains of Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome. An epidemic known as Ebola will also cause many deaths, as well as other unknown epidemics and illnesses which will sporadically arise and perplex the humans of Earth. Can you say SARS? West Nile. Okay, those are my editorial comments. 
However, most disasters will be brought about by politics. Before the start of World War III, France and Spain will undertake armed conflict against each other. And in France, Russia, and Sweden, there will be great unrest which will lead to rebellion and civil war. For example, the dictatorial agenda of the European Union will cause much unrest and rebellion in France and Sweden in particular, and the formation of organized crime rings will be a key contributing factor to unavoidable civil war. The European Union was not a fact in 81 and 87. It only became a fact fairly recently, if history serves me, my memory serves me about history. Um, maybe we should breathe for a moment on this, because there's more, and you're going to recognize some things that have already happened since this was written. Oh, man. Some pretty wild and crazy things going on there. Wild and woolly. Yes, sir. All right, we're going to take a short break, and uh, we'll return in about eight or nine after... We'll be taking your calls toll-free, 1-800-594-9270. That's 1-800-594-9270. And uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, where, where do you, you know, where do you just go with this? I mean, this is incredible. We're speaking tonight with Michael Horn. Check out his website, andyettheyfly.com. That's A-N-D-Y-E-T-T-H-E-Y-F-L-Y dot com. And yet they fly dot com. Check out the UFO pictures. The proof about, uh, the scientific proof about the Billy Meyer case being real. Check out the book. Order the book. It's 456 pages, 75 color photos, metal analysis, sound recordings, plenty in life. Advanced Technology and more. Tonight's show is sponsored by International Broadcasting Corporation, ticker symbol IBCS. Check them out, people. Not much stock left under six cents. They're a penny stock company when they started with us. They're under one cent. Very stable. Been going up and up. And uh, many exciting things coming with International Broadcasting Corporation and the Lou Gentilly Show as we are now strategically aligned. IBCmedia.com, ticker symbol IBCS. And the phone lines tonight are sponsored by Northstar-Technologies.com. That's Northstar-Technologies.com for the lowest and long distance rates, as well as local calling, cell phones, Internet access, the whole bag and whole ball of wax. And uh, if, you, if you're paying more than 3.9 cents per minute, people, you're paying way too much. Check them out, northstar-technologies.com. We'll be back to the Lou Gentilly Show right after this. Listening to Lou Gentilly's Paranormal Radio Network. The time is 12 midnight Eastern Standard. Do you know that Atros Pro, Apple Computer, and even Nike Shoes have all used government money to help ensure their success? And you can too. This year the government's going to give out over $350 billion for people like you who want to start a business, go back to school, or even train for a new job. I'm Matthew Lesko, and I've written over 70 books on government programs. You've probably seen me on Oprah, Larry King, or even C-SPAN. My new program shows you 15,000 government sources, like how to get $100,000 to open up a coffee shop, $15,000 to write a book, $30,000 to become a French chef, or $9,000 to take a computer course, or $15,000 to finish college, get a GED, or a PhD. There's also money programs to travel overseas or work on your invention. I've done all the work. You just have to make the call. Order your 1,100-page book plus six hours of audio tapes for two payments of twenty nine ninety five plus shipping. Call 1-800-221-2400. That's 1-800-221-2400. 
Hey, who's over there? Call Movie Fan, right? Yeah, talk so. You know that you can get them on a PC or a laptop right now? Yeah, instant call movies. Delivered on demand via the internet. And no waiting for no downloads. No few humongous files getting dumped on your hard drive. Forget about it. Know what else? You can have it all for one price per month. That's right. They call it cultmoviesonline.com. They got tons of that rare and unusual film stuff. It's to die for. Yeah, cultmoviesonline.com. They got horror movies, science fiction, exploitation, bada boom, bada bing, erotica. <laughs> That's right, baby. They got the pop culture, fantasy, and more. All for only $6.95 a month. So, I say, if you're bored while watching them same old movies from the video store or on the cable, check them out on the website. Yeah, watch full-length feature films streaming right into your computer with no fuss, no must. Hey, no popcorn already, all right? Hey, cultmoviesonline.com, unlimited access. Cultmoviesonline.com, $6.95 a month. Cancel your subscription at any time. On use demand, on use PC, cultmoviesonline.com. <laughs> a division of International Broadcasting Corporation, a publicly traded company. Tick a symbol IBCS. Do it now, before the price goes up. Do you scare easily? No? Good. Then we invite you to turn on your radio, turn off your lights, and join us here at The Chris Mill. The Chris Mill radio series is now available on CD. Each volume features three full-cast audio tales of the supernatural. Only $9.95 at www.amfmtheater.com. That's www.amfmtheater.com. Did you know that media mogul Ted Turner's net worth is estimated at $5 billion? Listen to his success story and how Wall Street played an important role. In 1971, with little or no money, Ted Turner merged his small billboard company into a publicly traded company called Rice Broadcasting. Creatively capitalizing on the situation, Ted Turner was able to access capital and build a media empire that began with the very first superstation, WTBS. This was only the beginning. Turner went on to create the the Cartoon Network, and Turner Film Classic. After an unsuccessful attempt to take over CBS television, Turner Broadcasting was acquired by AOL Time Warner, one of the largest media conglomerates in the world. Fortunes were made for those early shareholders of Rice Broadcasting that chose to participate. Like most things in life, those who get in at the earliest level stand to profit the most if the right opportunity presents itself. Check out International Broadcasting Corporation, a publicly traded company, ticker symbol IBC. International Broadcasting has three divisions, each focused on a niche market in the areas of broadcasting and Internet content. One of the most exciting ventures of the company is the creation of the IBC Radio Network, a 24-7 all-talk radio channel. The network is rapidly growing and gaining worldwide recognition for its unique shows, like Stock Talk Live, believed to be the very first business radio talk show focused exclusively on live, continuous coverage of microcap stocks throughout the entire stock market day. Other shows include The Lou Gentilly Show, a paranormal radio talk show covering a wide range of paranormal subjects like UFOs and alien abduction, government cover-ups, and haunting. Talk Show America is the home of entertaining, informative, and riveting political conservative talk radio. Are you a night owl? Don't miss Late Night Extreme Talk, a live call-in talk show from Las Vegas, Nevada, exploring some of the hottest issues of our day, news, politics, entertainment, and much more. So if you're looking for a unique investment opportunity, check out International Broadcasting Corporation, ticker symbol IBCS. Remember, investing is risky. As with all investments, you should consult with a financial advisor before getting involved. This announcement is paid for by IBCS and is not a solicitation to buy or sell securities. Always read the prospectus before making any investment decision. You could lose some or all of your money. You could make money, too. For more information, visit the website at www.ibcmedia.com. That's www.ibcmedia.com. Do you have enough life insurance? Think about it. Your loved ones could face disaster unless you provide for them now. Well, here's some good news. Just call Best Quote and chances are you could double your current coverage without paying a penny more. Regardless of your age or history, Best Quote has always been the best way to find the best rates from leading insurance companies. Imagine saving up to 70% on your premiums. For instance, a 35-year-old non-smoking male can get a quarter million dollars of coverage for less than $12 a month, guaranteed for 10 years. There's no obligation. Just call Best Quote for free information in the mail. Compare the rates. If you decide to buy, you call them. No salesman ever contacts you. With Best Quote, you can get more insurance and pay less. 
Rates are coming down, so now is the best time ever to call Best Quote. Call toll free 1-800-443-2005. That's 1-800-443-2005. Call 1-800-443-2005. Dependent on underwriting, Nicola GRX 10 Premier. Available in most states. Steve Rubin licensed agents. Call for state specific licensing. Northstar Technologies. Want a free cell phone with an outstanding rate plan? North Star Technologies has hundreds of cell phones and numerous rate plans to choose from, all at heavily discounted prices. An example of just one of these great deals includes a free Nokia 3390 cell phone, free car charger, free belt clip, and a hands-free system at no charge with a rate plan of 1,000 minutes of calling, free rollover unused minutes, and free voicemail, all for $39.99 per month. Visit North Star Technologies on the web at www.northstar-technologies.com or call toll-free at 1-888-408-7344. That's 1-888-408-7344. North Star Technologies, your company for the lowest prices on telephone and Internet services. Tell them Lou Gentili sent you. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. And I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. Get ready. <laughs> Exploring the unknown with the king of paranormal controversy. Welcome to the Legion Tilly Show. Back to the Lou Gentilly Show, third hour. Speaking tonight with Michael Horn. Taking your calls toll free, 1 800 594 9270. That's 1 800 594 9270. Check out uh, Michael's website, andyetthefly.com with two T's. That's andyetthefly.com. Exactly how it sounds. And uh, you can check out the UFO pictures, the wealth of information that's on the site, as well as um, all the scientific proof about the Billy Meyer case being real. All right, welcome back, Michael. Thank you. So, where do you where do you want to where do you want to start? <laughs> well, I don't know. Does anybody have any questions? We can roll on. If it's not. Well, I want to I want to get into get into where we left off. Okay, I can I can go from there. Uh, we just had you know a drubbing of America and talk about uh, things that would take place in Europe, and there's a lot more. Here's uh, I'll kind of jump to the next area. It says uh, hatred of for they're talking about tensions between uh native citizens and immigrants in, in France, I believe, many of whom observe religious beliefs different from those of the native populace, and that will be the point of conflict. Hatred of foreigners, strangers, and different religions, as well as the hatred of religion per se, and neo-Nazism, terrorism, and right extremism will be the order of the day. In England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, civil war-like conditions will be commonplace and cost many lives. The Soviet Union will be dissolved in this decade or, at the latest, by the beginning of the next decade. The key player in this will be Mikhail Gorbachev. But this will not lead to rest because the new Russia will continue its conflict with China over Inner Mongolia with the result that Russia will lose some territory to China. And now China will pose a threat, particularly to India, with whom it has uneasy relations even at this time. China will attack India with the result that biological weapons will be used, resulting in around 30 million deaths in the vicinity of New Delhi alone. 
This will not be all because as consequence of these biological bombs and missiles, which cannot be properly controlled, terrible epidemics up no, unknown up to this point will evolve and will quickly spread to many areas. Now, they're talking about a future thing, but knowing that China and uh, India are not the closest of friends and that the SARS epidemic thing has just come out of China, whether the play errands are right that it was a, you know got loose from a laboratory or not, we could see the thread perhaps of um, things perhaps unfolding that way. But here's something that I'm going to read and then I'll make a comment on. Under certain circumstances, Pakistan will allow itself to be misled into war against India, which will be particularly dangerous in view of the fact that both nations are developing the atom bomb. Now, this is a statement from 1987, maybe as far back as 81. We know that last year, Pakistan and India almost came to blows to a war in which they were even discussing using the nuclear weapons that are not in development, but that they now have. How do you do this? How do you get this, write this 22 uh, or, you know, or, uh, you know, 17 years ago, or whatever it is, and have these things be unfolding before our very eyes. And, and this is this is coming from extraterrestrials. Yes, this is called the Enoch prophecy, and actually, according to them, this is a prophecy that's actually quite ancient. I can't even begin to explain that, but they say that this is a prophecy thousands of years old. Hence, it's called the Enoch prophecy, and we've heard of Enoch and sure. Book of Enoch and all of that. They talk quite a bit about who Enoch really was, and that's a whole other <laughs> discussion and very complex stuff. They do speak here about, after uh, this whole thing, they're talking about a terrible whirlwind sweeping across northern Europe. They then state that Russia will not rest but will attack Scandinavia, affecting the whole of Europe. However, it must be pointed out that the Russian attack will take place in the summer and begin in Arkhangelsk, though this will not drag Denmark into the war owing to the insignificance of this country. Russia will not be satisfied with this attack, however, as its expansionist impulses will be enormous, prompting a military attack on Iran and Turkey, resulting in bloody fighting, horrific destruction, and conquest. Now, I'll stop there just for a comment. We know that Turkey uh, and the U.S. just had a little bit of difficulty because of t Turkey's non-full compliance as a you know launching point for the war. So should, let's say... Uh, relations between the U.S. and Turkey start to sour in coming time, could Russia take an opportunistic plunge there, knowing that there's going to be less enthusiasm for the U.S. to defend it? I don't know. But here's what you know they're saying back as far as 81 and 87. Then they say, the expansionist mentality of Russia will include the striving for control of Middle Eastern oil, as well as control of Southeast Europe, leading to a ruthless invasion of the Balkans resulting in great death and destruction. We've already seen some of that. And then they're talking about at this time that natural disasters occur in Italy with Vesuvius erupting again. And then a war spreading through that land will also claim many lives and cause great destruction. But in the northern countries, the, the destruction of war will descend on them as military might invades them from the east, murdering and burning, utilizing hitherto unknown laser and computer-controlled weapons, as well as raining down of bombs and rockets and causing destruction, first seizing Hungary, after which Austria and northern Italy will follow. Switzerland will be strongly affected but not targeted, and the involvement of Switzerland will be as a byproduct of France and Spain being the actual targets. The objective of the aggressors will be, however, to bring the whole of Europe under military control, operating their seat of power from France, a country which will not only be invaded by the aggressors, but will fall from within as a result of various collaborative forces working against it, probably made up of many foreigners living in France, particularly Muslims. Once France has fallen, a conquest of Spain and England will be undertaken, followed by a collaborative conquest of Scandinavia. Now, that's an interesting word. Why do they say collaborative? Well, here's what follows. 
all these French-based military operations will utilize that country's arsenal of weapons of mass destruction and exact evil domination, destruction, and annihilation. The aggressors from the east will force the French army to join their military forces and conquer the northern countries of Europe, including Sweden and Norway, which will thereafter be annexed by Russia. Finland will also be invaded, resulting in many deaths and great destruction and complete dissolution, followed by a long Russian occupation. Now, here's an interesting thing that follows. Pardon me, I needed a little <coughs> oil for my mouth here. <laughs> In the form of H2O, I might add. Okay. At this time, the German citizens will fight a civil war and simultaneously be attacked by a large army from East Germany. However, Germany will succeed in freeing itself from the yoke of the aggressors after violent conflict with the invading military forces. Now, we would say, wait a minute, that's got to be wrong. Civil war... East Germany, West Germany are no longer separate. It's one country, right? right. So, my first comment would be, should that be referring uh, inaccurately to a East Germany, West Germany uh, attack, it's to the credit that they left it in as a prophecy that got altered through circumstances of people changing things, right? Right. Now, the other way I've read it, they say at this time the German citizens will fight a civil war, simultaneously be attacked by a large army from East Germany. However, Germany will succeed in freeing itself pardon me, from the yoke of the aggressors after violent conflict with the invading military forces. After a certain time, the people ru will rise up against the aggressors and invaders, instigating a European fight for freedom. So it may be that what they're saying is that this invading force, it could be Russians, maybe the Chinese, I'm not sure yet if that's what it means here, but it, they could be coming in through East Germany and that the Germans will fight the invading military forces. Could that make sense to you? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. At the same time that civil war rages in Germany, horrific bloody revolution will break out in England, which will cost even more lives than those lives. This is very doom and gloom stuff. I mean, I have to apologize for you know, being the doom and gloom hour here, but this is what's written in here, and, and uh, let's just deal with it and see what we make of it. Well, well out of curiosity, yeah. um, has it ever crossed your mind that a lot of what... Is, is there, you think, a possibility that what information he's receiving... You know how people who channel spirits and whatnot, right. you know, they channel spirits. Is it possible that maybe he's not... Maybe he's not in contact with ETs. He's in contact with some form of spirit. Well, two things. This document, um, as I said, was ostensibly given to him first in 81, updated in 87, and this man, Quetzal, is reading this to him. This then is recorded, and he, when he goes home, they broadcast it to him, if you will, and he types it out. So this is from physical contact. This is not in, in any sense channeled. Now, Meyer does say that there is a higher level of spirit that he has actually, you know, written information from, but this is not it. Okay. So he he's pretty uh, emphatic uh, about condemning what, you know, what we call channeling and all this stuff and saying that really it is very rare that any humans are in the position capable of receiving accurate information from truly much higher spiritual levels. Most of the stuff that is channeling, uh, they would say is either information coming from a person's own ego, subconscious, subpersonalities, or if there are other entities possibly involved, they're usually not very highly evolved entities. Hence, uh, with and I, I've, I'd spent many years checking out channeled material, and my commentary had been that from maybe eight years of being around, you know, going to different things and you know, taking note of it, that there was a thimble full of accurate information that with room left over for an Olympic-sized swimming pool, I did not find really compellingly good, accurate stuff that you can take to the bank. It doesn't mean that some people didn't get some stuff right, because it doesn't, again, take only one person or extraterrestrials to uh, have psychic impressions and be accurate about things. We know there are people that have those abilities, but the specificity of the previous information on which Meyer's credibility and the Play Aaron's credibility rests at 30 years' worth of stuff that's why I give any credence to something like this, not gleefully saying, oh, isn't this wonderful, but rather 
if they're saying that this is what we, humanity, have created, unless we really change some stuff and get about that right now, um, we're really on the wrong path. And when you read stuff in here like America you know, bringing other nations on board for wars, the destruction of the World Trade Center, the near the nuclear confrontation of Pakistan and India, by golly, that's pretty specific. I mean, and there's many other specific things in here, but we can't say that they've all occurred. Well, have they, have they mentioned anything about when people will finally wake up and smell the coffee that they exist? Well, it's, see, again, we have free will. They, they are not raving optimists. They, they, by the way, let me say, there is a big thing we should get into before we end the show with some very positive points and, you know, and what we can do to change things and all of that. Some of it, you know, again, doesn't take an ET. Some of it might be unique in its, its specificity. But they're saying, look, as they've even hinted in here, until people wake up and take their power back, not through uh, violent wars and, and revolutions, but through reason and banding together. Basically, and Meyer has written some recent things, some of which are on the website people can look at, and it's very harsh towards us, and they basically said leaders like Saddam Hussein's Yasser Arafat, they include Ariel Sharon and George Bush, and all their ilk and supporters should be banished to, to an island where they can do no damage. That's how they deal with it. See, I'll jump into a little bit about what they their philosophy is they're not pacifists these are not uh, doe-eyed uh, peace you know uh, and love and flower children throwing things around these people are armed they defend themselves they say that it is a not only a right but a, a spiritual uh, responsibility to defend yourself it's a crime to allow yourself to be victimized so they don't uh, you know take to being attacked and annihilated Yet they come from a long lineage of very violent uh, forefathers who uh, used tremendous power and, and destroyed whole planetary systems. You're going back into the millions of years ago thing, and yes, that's speculative. But what they've said about us is, as long as we, uh, and they were very specific that a lot of that we had to do with America, launch these bombings of countries and invasions and all that, we will only only, as sure as the sun comes up in the morning, provoke retaliation, revenge, and terrorism in the wake. Well, what, how do you deal with terrorists? Their country was attacked. And their answer is this, and they say this is exactly what they've employed in their world, and this is what other people have employed when they get ready to actually have peace in their world. They form a true universal combat peace force. Uh, we might think of a, a, a truly effective UN with a few, you know, adjustments. The, the force is drawn equally from all the countries on earth. It is beholden to no power, no superpower, no veto from one country, no manipulation. There are true universal global laws which are enforced by this global force. That means if dictators arise and start, uh, what's the right word here, uh, taking advantage of their own people, persecuting and destroying their people, if terrorists arise, if wars are about to be launched, this force, this armed force, identifies with the help of the international law community the perpetrators and it goes to arrest them. It doesn't go to bomb countries. It doesn't go to destroy the power plants and the water system and the infrastructure of countries and punish innocent human beings and create further dreadful consequences. Now, a lot of terrorists and, and dictators and all these are, people are not going to roll over and say, put the handcuffs on. So, in the course of going to apprehend these people, if the culprits offer armed resistance and they are killed by the peace combat force, that's fine and dandy. That's, you know, their karma, to use a tired word. But it's true. They've provoked their own demise. And in that case, there is no uh, negative burden upon the troops for performing their duty any more there, than there is even in wars that many of us don't favor when, a, when soldiers who have a duty and an obligation for their profession to carry out the orders of their country, the exception being if they willfully commit you know, a violations of international law and, and crimes against humanity. So these peace combat troops go and they apprehend those surviving culprits. They are brought before a true international tribunal. They don't execute people, and I know this will upset a lot of people that want to scream for blood, but they said it's really foolish to... Uh, you know, kill people after the fact. Banishment to a same-sex, remoted location with no technology and no hope of ever 
getting off, where these people are thrown in with their own kind, and they have to survive on their own, you know, plant their food and grow it, and, you know, they can have their books, and that's about it. They can choose to learn, and for those that will suffer pangs of conscience, they have the opportunity at evolution. Now, why don't they have capital punishment? These are people that say the reason for that is very practical. From their perspective, each human being has an indwelling human spirit. They don't use the word soul for that. They, they apply that to something else. The spirit is this eternal part of us that incarnates over and over and over in the course of tens and tens of millions of incarnation, incarnations over billions of years on a deliberate, purposeful path of evolution. We're in one of the nasty phases of it where it's real messy. If you simply take an offending person, a killer, even a vicious uh, Saddam Hussein or anybody else, let's say you have the opportunity to arrest these people and you execute them, the spirit of that person, that offender, does not have the opportunity, whether they'll take it or not, but the opportunity to evolve in this lifetime more than they are already evolved. So what happens is that spirit, generally if it's executed, the spirit comes back quicker than the normal incarnational interval, and it is still of the consciousness and bound to a consciousness of murder and crime. One of the reasons we have an escalating crime rate is because of our lack of understanding of that and the murders that go on all over the world, including the capital punishments. So they're saying as much as people want to lust for blood, it's really counter productive but we uh, for the most part don't even know that there's a human spirit and that there there are laws of that spirit's development and there are some of this information all of the, the religions of the world contain according to them some true spiritual teaching and information but it's wrapped in falsehoods and cultic things fear and you know terror and uh, sin and mainly to control people so that they don't evolve spiritually I, I don't mean to well, that, that's fine. Let me ask you this question: What, what religion was uh, Billy Meyer before he had, you know, all this experience? Well, his family he was. Religion? Remember, his experiences started when he was five. His family, they, I don't know if his family was Presbyterian or whatever. Uh, in, I've never asked him what that was. Whatever the parish parish priest was, perhaps he was a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a Methodist. So Meyer himself. Uh, was you know raised in that. I'm sure he was probably taken to church and everything else. And then when the play iron started deal with him, they sent him to, you know, they said, you know, go spend time in this monastery uh, or ashram in India and travel here and do this and learn this and learn about Buddhism and Hinduism and Christianity and Judaism and Islam and all the rest of this because uh, it's going to be real important for for what you're going to do later in life. You're going to have to understand this. Right. Hmm. So, um, I mean, there's more I can read from the prophecy stuff, but I wanted to just, you know, say this is some of the meat and potatoes of all this. So after they've talked about all these countries in England and Ireland being at odds and all that, they they say that um, that this you know cheerful death, destruction, and annihilation will rage not only in Europe but also in America. Again, they talk about where there's going to be much suffering and many will die, and there'll be much destruction and annihilation. America and Russia. The countries with the greatest stockpile of weapons of mass destruction, a fact which they say is already almost true today, meaning 81 and 87, will at this time engage in monstrous conflict with the result that Canada will be dragged into the conflict as a consequence of a Russian attack on Alaska and Canada. They speak then about civil wars breaking out in America, which will result in its being divided up into five different areas. If that ain't enough. Hmm. So that's, a, a, I, I didn't give everything because there's just so much in here. That's some of the, you know, the meat of the matter, if you will. And what they're trying to say, really, and what they're trying to do, um, they're trying to get us to pay attention, to talk to each other, to realize we have to find a way to take our power back, to, to break this pattern where in particular and specifically where the American government can pick a country and decide it's going to do a regime change and install this and put that in there and, you know, liberate a people and blah, 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 where they're just saying, look, this has got nothing to do with that. This is about power. Uh, this is about control, and they've 
talked about the oil and all the rest of this and the mineral rights, and this has been written about for a long time, quite frankly, for 2,000 years in the other documents that are connected to this case. So you've got, you, you've got like, well, what do we do with this? Why are we hearing about this? What is this nonsense? What's this guy talking about? Well, it's just, a, you know, it's a pebble being dropped into a pond. If we just, by waking up, can start in our minds to alter and to say, you know what? We don't want this. We don't want these kind of, we, It isn't important to go next into Syria, and then we're going to march through Iran and all this stuff. Maybe that's not the right thing to do. Maybe it doesn't work this way. Maybe we are causing ourselves tremendous problems. Uh, can we start to think about this? You know, this is what occurs to me. You know, the simplest thing. How do we, how do we deal with this? I, I stumble with it, trying to make a, a more coherent statement sometimes, because I sometimes know how this sounds. If I think about how this sounds to hear this over the airways, or when I'm doing a lecture and I'm presenting all the slides and the videos, and then you're talking about this stuff, people go, "What are we supposed to do?" You know. Well, the first thing is we've got to wake up and, you know, call radio stations and TV stations and write letters and make noise because that's the only way we're going to we're gonna wake ourselves up. We've got to communicate. Sure, well, I mean, you're going to get the, you know, the bunkers attacking you, but if people go to the, to the Rents website and they take a look, which we'll eventually post in ours, and we look at the article, these people can't debunk this anymore. The Meyer case is authentic until somebody can show some other conclusion. Well, I mean, you know, as far as, as these ETs w with prophecy and whatnot, I mean, why don't they, I don't understand why they see how the world's going. Well, why they don't do something? Well, you know, why? Why don't they do something? I mean, they're, they're here anyway. You know, well, I'll tell you, the answer is this, um, as I understand it. The laws of cause and effect mm, dictate that when you sow your seeds, uh, we've heard this in all sorts of philosophies and religions, so you will reap. Right. If they interfere and change something, we will not learn the lesson. So the next best thing is to warn us, you're going the wrong way. Well, if somebody says that, well, who knows? Are they real? How can you prove it? We have 30 years' worth of accurate information, 25 years in advance of some of it, do you want to reorganize your brain cells? Well, I, I would I would agree with that. The only thing is, is that you know they say they don't want to they don't want to uh, mess with anything, but yet people are getting abducted and their lives have completely been ruined and, and changed and whatnot. So, well, I how... can answer, but let me address that from their point of view. Okay. I'm just sharing you information yeah. from the case. Yes, there have been abductions, and and um, they spoke at the earliest about the Betty and Barney Hill abduction from of the 60s, the Zeta Reticulum being. But what they said, and what they've said even recently, is this. The world is gripped with a nonsensical hysteria, and mass hysteria at that, based on a lot of illusion. There have been relatively few people who have been quote-unquote abducted, for the most part, although there are exceptions. The beings who have examined people have not been malevolent, Though somebody who experiences this won't feel so great about it, right. but even the idea that people had been hypnotized, or uh, pardon me, rather, that their memories had been suppressed, was an indication that the beings understood that this is trauma, that if these people know, don't know this ever happened, that's fine. We're ga gathering our information. Why? Because we can. Why did we bomb Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, we can. Well, these people aren't trying to hurt anybody, at least we're talking about the benevolent ones. They've done this to gather information. The Playarans have said categorically, there is no hybrid babies being, you know, bred in tubes on, on spaceships, and no, they don't need us to build another race and all this stuff. Our genetics are, have been tampered with so badly with aggression genes and light, uh, lifespan limitations that our scientists will undo. This is also in the case that this is hysteria and nonsense, and it, it catches fire. People gather this from movies and stories, and if somebody tells an accurate case, they're saying, look, it ain't happening like that. There are no reptilians having sex with the earth women. There's a lot of people thinking this stuff is going on, right. but a lot of people are in hysteria. So they're, they're saying, look, there are malevolent beings, and you guys are going to have to deal with them. There's some folks out there even more wicked than you are. And the time will come when you will come face to face, and you better be a united world at that point, or you're going to get creamed. So they have settled. There's thousands of pages of stuff here that covers 
just about anything you can imagine, from from abortion to, to food, from suntan, uh, from the dangers of sunscreens and suntanning it. Pardon me. Uh, from another point of view, to what are the chemical compounds in alcohol and, and tobacco that are dangerous, and what amount of vitamin C do human beings? I mean, some of the most mundane stuff that they've published and seems to be turning out to be that that stuff accurate too. Well, or, let me answer this yeah. question. Then. How about have you heard anything about Planet X? Uh, they have not spoken that there is really a Planet X thing. They have said there is a deep impact scenario that is coming to a planet near us, as a matter of fact, this one. But it seems to be still slightly in the distant future. That impact, they say, it's a prediction that it will occur in the area somewhere near, I think, the Black Sea, Red Sea, or Bering Sea. That There's an area in that part of the world, and I'm not looking at a map in my geography, ain't that keen right now. <laughs> but they're saying that that will cause quite a bit of destruction. It's going to throw up a huge, you know, amount of stuff into the air and tidal waves. But that's something that cannot be altered because it's a cosmic event. It's not tomorrow. It's not in, you know, May or June of this year. And that from what I've gathered, this Planet X thing, and I haven't, I'll have to see if they have even anything on the websites about it, is uh, more misplaced hysteria. You know, we had all sorts of stuff. Now, on the other hand, it was interesting, and it is on their documents from the website, and that in 19, I think it was 78, when Meyer was writing in his book, Existing Life in the Universe, that he predicted that at the end of the 1980s that a comet would be discovered that would be called Tutatis, T-O-U-T-A, uh, T-O-U-T-A-T-I-S, or whatever it is, Tutatis, and that it would come closest to the Earth in September of 2004. Turns out that, I think it was early 1990, or somewhere right around there, the French discovered a comet, and what did they name it? Tutatis, and indeed, it's supposed to come closest to the Earth, something like September 4th or 24th, 2004. So he was back in the ballpark again on that one, and he was only about 10 years ahead of the discovery. But there's so much of this in the material. And I have personally met with a, a, a physicist named Dr. David Froning, who uh, found Meyer's material, as I did in 1979, and his jaw dropped because he was reading Meyer's material from 75, speaking about tachyon propulsion systems for hyperspace travel. Froning is an expert in hyperspace propulsion theory because we don't have real hyperspace propulsion yet. And he said that he was astounded that this simple one-armed farmer, quote-unquote, was even talking about tachyons, a rarefied field of discussion among scientists and a select few at that, that the figures that Meyer had published on these velocities and things were within 20% of the calculations that he and these scientists came up with using complex calculation formulas, and he couldn't say that Meyer was wrong. That ain't small potatoes. And when I was doing a lecture about 12 years ago in Los Angeles on this, Froning got up in front of 450 people, and when he was asked what he thought about this, he says, I and a select group of scientists study the material and the films in the Billy Meyer case. We have made breakthroughs in our understanding of zero-point energy from this case. Thank you very much and good night. And people were sitting there with their jaws wide open. He's never, not only has he never reneged on that, there are a bunch of other scientists who have examined the material in the Meyer case, uh, and they have, uh, in, there's a document called An Open Letter to the UFO Community by author Gary Kinder, that is on the Swiss side. I don't know if we've posted that yet. But he's got, I don't know, 10 or 12 experts in everything from photography, from J, you know JPL, USGS, a special effects expert who worked on Stanley Kubrick films, two sound engineers, uh, you name it. And these people have said, this material is not hoax. We can't tell you what the heck these things are, but they sure ain't models on strings. So this is what the, you know, the Billy Meyer case, a lot of what is here and... Uh, most of the world doesn't yet know about it, but thanks to you and other people, and tonight, more people around the world are learning about it. Mm. I hope that they are not having bad dreams, uh, and that they will take anything that has disturbed them as a little bit of incitement to get about the positive part of it, and maybe, you know, we should deal a little bit with what's positive in this case. And, and well, what, 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 what good, uh, you know, what good do the ETs have to say about, you know, the future of mankind? Sure. Well, here's the good news, and I'm glad you actually said that, otherwise we might not even just address that. Humanity is going to survive. What is in question is how much of it right now 
Are we going to destroy two-thirds of the population and take a couple centuries to pull ourselves together back to a functioning world with, you know, where the radioactivity and the poisons have to be cleaned and the epidemics and the mutations? That's a real possibility if we, if we go this direction, if we allow, according to them for sure, if we allow this particular administration to march on and do this stuff, we're going to get the stuff that's in the prophecies. If we don't, if we realize that there is a tremendous positive future, we will be space traveling. We will have lifespans that will go up to 145, 250, 350, and more years over the centuries as we become ready to become a space traveling race. We will explore Mars. We will find, indeed, that our forefathers, many of them did live on Mars uh, prior to the time that it was destroyed in a cosmic catastrophe, we will learn that there was a third planet in the solar system also inhabited by humans that was destroyed by those people when they warred amongst themselves, that portions of that long-destroyed planet re revolve around as parts of the asteroid belt. We will find still operating uh, stations that could be uh, used in some ways in the subsurface of Mars and uh, on that planet. We will learn a lot of enormous things. We will also face other dangers from space travel. We will evolve as a space traveling human race when we successfully pass through this period. This they call it, this is the transition period in this new age or Aquarian age. And they don't poo poo astrology. They just say that we don't for the most part, have a full, real understanding of, of true astrology, that, of course, the planets have influences. These are huge bodies, and that um, there are some people. They mentioned one man whose name is escaping me, who was actually an accurate uh, astrologer and writes with a great deal of wisdom about the actual effect of planets, and that th this is something that is real, uh, but horoscopes and newspapers you know, are entertaining and all. They're not what you want to base that understanding on. They are saying, look, if you people want to get on with the business at hand, not only do you have to wake up and get the bozos out of the offices that they occupy, where they're being selling out your various countries, trashing your rights and constitutions so they can run rampant for greedy and power-hungry means that have nothing to do with bringing peace to people, you know, with bombs dropping on their heads, and you'll want to bring down in a normal way, not through destruction and misery, you want to bring down your, your birth rates so that the planet can... Uh, sustain you and you can move into sustainable population numbers which are far lower than the ones we have right now because you a lot of this aggression and war and and greed and, and power stuff is because too many people vying for resources vying for space for food for distribution and consequently for power we must get rid of nuclear power plants as we have them today because they are an unfixable, toxic, long-lasting source of misery. The fact that atomic bombs have been de detonated and tested, and some still may be, destroys vital aspects of the planet and leaves us with toxic contaminants for millennium to come. It affects our bodies, our genetics, our food, our development, every level of our life. These people are as far advanced as they are, and they claim to be not only space but time-traveling peoples on their own worlds. They do not allow their industries to exist such as that they could pollute. They have extremely advanced levels, and a lot of this is in the book. People can read about how these people ostensibly live from, from Guido's book. But they also, they have a very advanced agriculture, genetic engineering to make the most productive, efficient, nutrient-rich foods. They're not vegetarians. But what they did was they stopped using the animals themselves as food and protein sources, and they cultured, much as people now would grow tofu, which they don't recommend, but much as we would grow these cultured foods, they culture and grow meat. So they don't have to actually kill animals anymore as weird as that may sound, but they're saying that animal proteins are essential for the development of brain and body, and that's simply a fact of the human bodies in this planet. Well, have they said anything? We'll, we'll take some calls sure. uh, and, and, and after, after you answer this. 1-800-594-9270. That's 1-800-594-9270. got about 10 minutes left. Um, have they said anything about when or if we will ever be in space or yes. how our technology is going to grow? They actually took Meyer, uh, if, this is speculative because I can't prove it, but they took him, according to this, forward and backward in time. They showed him 
future Earth space traveling people who had moved out in the first um, you know, elementary steps of, of true space travel. I mean, our throwing tin cans at the moon is not space travel, but we'll get there. And we will, uh, we have a destiny if we can survive and, and wake up. We have a destiny that will take us to the farthest reaches of this galaxy. And they've written extensively about that. We will ultimately be going into the Syrian star system, which is, they say, the true home of this genetic lineage of humans on this planet. That material is also contained in the Meyer case, and it's fascinating. It's, it's vast, and it's, it's, it's spellbinding where our true forefathers may well have come from. And, of course, even the Dilgon tribe of Africa rep, you know, speaks with reverence of the, of the dog star Sirius and talks about the forefathers from there. So a lot of these things are, have been known in bits and pieces, and, of course, a lot has been destroyed over time in terms of knowledge and evidence. But... Yeah, we have a destiny. We have a spiritual destiny as well to become, as these people have, people, humans on the path of true evolution, not barbaric, cultic, political, military, religious, dominating, fighting on this little wee little speck of cosmic lint floating somewhere in space, thinking that any of us are the crowning glory of creation and having the right to rough, rough, you know, run roughshod over each other. It's futile and it's painful, and if we would decide to not go kicking and screaming, we'll have a more glorious time of it. Hmm. All right. You're on the Gentilly Show. Who am I speaking with? Hello, uh, this is Ron. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, this all sounds great and everything, but uh, there's only one problem. People don't have the ability to uh, you know, form one world and one government because people don't have that ability in them. Uh, people are sinful people, and they, they just don't have the ability to, to live with each other. And uh, eventually, uh, Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to make everything right. And, uh, you know, all the people will be transformed, and, you know, the sinful, evil ways will be taken out of them. But before that happens, there's going to be a one-world government, like you're talking about, and a one-world leader, which is the Antichrist. And I believe he's going to use these uh, those aliens to uh, come about, like, you know, like a one-world, uh, you know, government, but it's, it's going to be a false government and uh, it's going to deceive a lot of people and because you know, they're going to think that, oh, this is great and all, but I, I just hope the people realize that uh, the aliens aren't going to save us. Well, in much the same way they would say, do not look for a savior at any time from any course, that the man that we uh, know as Jesus, they say his true given name was Emmanuel, as it was indeed predicted or prophesied in the book of Isaiah, 714, I believe. And what they're saying is this man was a true teacher. He brought spiritual truth. It was corrupted by uh, people of the time and people that followed after him. And, you know, we could, we could argue prophecy and we could argue uh, what's true and who's coming to save us and all the rest. Basically, if you can he hear whatever it is that resonates with you from what wakes you up and what wakes me up, we get about our business. It may be a very long and arduous task, but the alternative is far more painful and far more uh, unpleasant. Well, Jesus is uh, the only way to the true God. Well, that's a nice belief. You're, You're entitled to it. Like you learn that from something. Those are beliefs that you learn from a book, and you've taken that on, and that may be true for you. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's true for everybody else. But time will tell, and you may be right, and who knows. So um, I am just saying, if people could say that about what I'm talking to you tonight about. The difference here is this. We've got contemporary, specific, pertinent things that we can point to that show the credibility of the information. And we are in it. We're in some of the information that was written specifically 22 or 17 years ago, whichever the updated version. Uh, to me, that, that supersedes any of our religious texts because they, they had been re redacted and edited and altered and adulterated. They are no longer even the original writings of the people who only put some of those things, like the New Testament, together 150 years after the death of the man. The Old Testament was changed, too. So as much as we can say there is truth in those books, and I'm sure there is, the spiritual truth and law, they've been messed with considerably, and they do not give us the specificity and the take-it-to-the-bank stuff. You'll have to simply rely 
on your belief in it. And if that's sufficient for you, I'm not the one to argue with you. All right, Ron, i got to run, bro. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks. All right, one eight hundred five nine four ninety two seventy. That's one eight hundred five nine four ninety two seventy. You're on the Lou Gentilly show. Who am I speaking with? I can barely hear you. Okay, Lou. This is Gary from Tennessee. Okay, Gary. Well, good evening, Lou. Good evening. And good evening, Michael. Hi, this Gary. Is Gary. Hi, I've Gary. Uh, chatted with you online or not online, but uh, by email a couple of times. Okay. Good to hear from you folks, and Lou, I would like to say you have got the clearest and the most perfect audio on the Internet that of anyone I have heard. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> All righty. Uh, Lou, I'm glad to hear that you've got um, you got Michael on tonight, and uh, Michael, I've been online all night listening, and I've uh, been on the chat room also there, Lou. Okay. A uh, couple of people have had a couple of uh, questions that uh, did bring up something that we might need to address here, Michael. Yes, sir. Do you, is there has there been any kind of a recent photos that uh, Billy Meyer has taken of any UFO craft or anything like that since uh, I think uh, maybe seventy nine? Right. Well, let me tell you about that. Um, actually, in uh, right around the eighties, there's a stunning video, and you can see some of this on the website, uh, either ours or the one in, from Switzerland. I'm not sure exactly which one it's on, but just to give you this uh, answer. Um, as recently as a couple years ago in May, a man there, um, Freddie, uh, and I, I'm trying to remember his last name, I won't st- waste time with that, but I've met him on two occasions now. He and 17 other people observed two of the discs in broad daylight, I think it was May of 2001 or two, and they photographed them for like a half hour. The Playarans told Meyer that they were not going to do any more photo ops specifically for him because now that the computer age was upon us, people could argue, and credibly so, that, well, he's just, you know, he's doing trick photography. So they produced all this photographic evidence back between 75 and, let's say, 80 or so, and said that's going to be it. But other people have photographed the ships, and, and there's four other photographers that we know of altogether. I've talked to two of them, including Guido and Freddie, and there's, I think, two others, and one fellow, and a, a woman I know ended up in a photograph that was taken at the center and behind them one of the ships was hovering by the trees and they didn't see it until they developed the film. So yes, there has been fairly recent stuff. All right. Uh, mighty fine, Mark. Thank you, uh, there's, uh, you know, That has been a major question and uh, um, I do remember seeing some of those photos and uh, you know, the ones that uh, have questioned about that just need to take a look. Mm-hmm. Uh, you made a couple other mentions that uh, or some other questions out there that was how we can change what our future is. Yes. Uh, you know, Michael and Lou, also, if we look back and listen to what people like the Hopi, uh, present-day people like Greg Braden and others have had to say, our thoughts that become our feelings of what our future is going to be yes. is what it may very well be. Mm-hmm. Michael, what do you think of... Uh, that kind of concept. Well, they, uh, Meyer and the Playarans as well, from my understanding, echo the idea our thoughts uh, create our actions as well as our feelings, our reality. We are responsible. They say that one of the best things you can do is to observe your thoughts. Be conscious of what you're thinking and so that you can know what your subconscious is about. When you catch yourself creating or doing negative thinking, then you would balance that thought you would decide oh i'm not going there uh it's a little the time is so tight to try to explain this maybe we can go into it more than the time but to listen to our own thoughts and correct them and that way we actually increase our own intelligence our awareness and our spiritual development and by the way i should mention there's a billymeyer.com where that contact 251 may be available uh bi it's i think it's capital b-i-l-l-y uh capital m-e-i er.com you may also be linked from the and yet they fly website or send me an email if, if you don't find something but the contact 251 has been available there i think it may still be up there under the semyaze contact reports and that has all the stuff also about our original beginnings in the syrian star system and meyer speaks about so many things but what gary's bringing up here is so vitally important because it is up to us our evolution is we're not According to them, we're not going to be saved by anybody. We don't need it. Our spirit indwelling within each one of us has the potential of this universe in terms of its power. And that's 
goes farther into what this case is really about in terms of the spiritual teachings and the, the beauty of all that. We've got to get through this period, and waking up spiritually would sure not hurt us at all. So I don't want to preach on it or anything like that, but I think we could start to look in here for that kind of guidance. And, and in the Hopi information that Gary mentioned and other teachings, there's plenty of teachings where we're taught self-responsibility and to watch our thoughts and develop ourselves and and you know, focus more on, on spirit and kindness and love without being namby pamby and, and Pollyannish about it, and taking care of ourselves at the same time. Okay. I want to thank you for your call. Thanks a lot, Lou. And I enjoyed you having uh, Michael on here tonight. And I hope you'll have him back sometime in the near future, my friend. Not a problem. Have a good night. Thanks, sir. Bye bye. Okay. Very interesting stuff. And uh, probably we could probably talk about this for. Our, Hours and hours on end. I'll tell you, there's just not enough time in the, in the show for it. So I'm going to get you back. Um, Love to. I'll be in Switzerland for a week in May, and I'm going to see if I can learn anything new. It's not like there isn't enough stuff here, but I'd be delighted to talk to you again and your audience. Sure. All right. Um, I want to thank you very much. How can people How can people uh, order the book, uh, the Billy Meyer sure. contest, well, uh, and yet they fly? They can go to the website, and then the uh, – Publisher's distributor has an 800 number for those people that prefer that. It's 800-345-6665. Now, for people that get nervous about that, that's not our number. That's the distributor for uh, for many book publishers. It's 800-345-6665 or andyettheyfly.com. And certainly send emails. I'll always try to respond to people that write if they're interested and if I can help. And this way, you know, do the, study it yourself and see that there's a lot more than just this heavy stuff, but we have to bring it to the forefront. We're in these times, and they've been foretold by many people, not just the play irons. It's just that they appear to be giving us specifics and some specifics as to how to help ourselves through it. I also see that you have a... Um you could download a special report on the photographic analysis? Yeah, that's for people that want to see what, you know, because uh, there was significant photographic analysis done. Either we have on the site or we will have the sound analysis that that was done to. Tremendous research has been done into this. It's mind-boggling that one man with one arm could have pulled together <laughs> the physical evidence, the informational evidence, the scientific stuff, the prophecy. Uh, you know, it's, it's an enormous, enormous task. And if we want to check it out and see whether it holds water or not, then we go to work and spend maybe an equal amount of time checking it out. All right, cool, Michael. All right, visit his site, and yet they fly dot com, and uh, join his mailing list for updates and news and whatnot on what's going on with uh, Billy Meyer and uh, Michael Horn. I want to thank you very much, my friend, and uh, I will be talking. Thank you so much, Lou. All right, have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye. Very interesting story. Very, very interesting. And uh, if you didn't, if you missed the show, you can check it out in the archives tomorrow when it's up. Um, we've been speaking tonight with Michael Horn, and we've been talking for the most part about the Billy Meyer contacts. And uh, incredible. And uh, definitely check out the book. And yet they fly 456 pages with 75 color photos and uh, metal analysis, sound recordings, and. Uh, all kinds of, of interesting information in there about probably one of the most fascinating, incredible, scientifically proven cases of UFOs and alien contact. The Billy Meyer case is uh, by far one of the most fascinating. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to end it for the Lou Gentilly Show. I'd like to thank everybody who's listening. Don't forget to... Uh, Tune in with us tomorrow night, 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. However you're listening to us, that's how you listen in tomorrow night. And uh, we'll be speaking with none other than Lloyd Pye. Yes, Lloyd Pye will be on the show tomorrow night. And uh, we're going to be getting some updates from him and whatnot and uh, talking about all kinds of interesting things with uh, the Star Child Project and, and whatnot. So definitely tune in tomorrow night with Lloyd Pye. Anyway, tonight's show is sponsored by International Broadcasting Corporation. People, check them out, ibcmedia.com. And uh, their ticker symbol is IBCS. And uh, I'll tell you what, stock is on the move. And uh, it's a penny stock company, so get in now while the getting's good. 
A lot of amazing things are going to be happening with International Broadcasting Corporation. At the same time, the phone lines are sponsored by Northstar-Technologies.com for the lowest and long-distance rates. You won't be sorry. 3.9 cents per minute. Northstar-Technologies.com. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, above all, God bless. Thank <laughs> you.